Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of the joint uh, NIH CIHR symposium on heterogeneity of diabetes, beta cells, phenotypes, and precision medicine. My name is Norm Rosenblum. I am scientific director of the CIHR Institute of Nutrition, Metabolism, and Diabetes, and I am joined by my co chair. Dr. Will Cephalou, who is Director of the Division of Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Metabolic Diseases at the NIDDK. Today I'm speaking to you from Toronto. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, the greater Toronto area is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land, and I feel privileged to be able to speak to you from this land today. Yesterday, we had a great day of presentations, which focused on islet cell biology, islet cell engineering, and disease mechanisms, and then we transitioned into our first of two sessions on phenotypes related to diabetes. And today we'll be continuing in the uh, first session with that theme. And before I introduce our co-moderators for that session, I'd just like to remind everyone to share your thoughts and impressions on Twitter at hashtag diabetes2021. And now I'll hand it over to our co-moderators for this session, Anna Gloin from Stanford University and Mina Wu from the University of Toronto. Anna and Mina, over to you. Thank you, Norm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mina Wu, and it's a pleasure for me to be co-moderating this session uh, with uh, my co-moderator, Anna Gloin, who will introduce herself shortly. Uh, my name is Mina Wu, and uh, I'm the Division Director for Endocrinology and Metabolism. I'm an adult endocrinologist. And uh, it's a particular honor for me to be in this session um, also as a division director at Toronto General, where nearly 100 years ago, Leonard Thompson received his first dose of insulin. And the, the rest is history as we celebrate today and to really be looking forward to the next, um, you know, iterations and precisions in, in treating this complex uh, disease. So with, uh, as Norm mentioned, for the part two of the phenotype heterogeneity session, we'll be focusing on uh, tools and strategies which will really help us better understand this complex diabetes that was outlined uh, beautifully um, with many, many lectures yesterday. And I very much look forward to the line of speakers for this session. So please, as Norm mentioned, uh, upload your questions and we'll have uh, fulsome discussions um, at the end of the session. And um, I introduce now uh, Anna Gloin. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Mina. Good morning, everyone. A uh, very good morning from California. Um, I am delighted to be taking part this morning in this session. We've got an excellent lineup of uh, speakers. A uh, huge thank you to NIH and to CIHR for the uh, invitation to, to moderate this session and be part of this fantastic uh, symposium. Uh, just to remind you that we have a social media policy and that our speakers today will be indicating whether or not they are happy for you you to take screenshots of their slides and to disseminate those on uh, social media. So please look out for their cues in their talks about whether or not they're happy for their work to be uh, photographed and shared. So let, uh, let's get uh, started with the uh, morning's event. And I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Dr. John Dennis, who's really one of the rising stars coming out of the Exeter stable in uh, the United Kingdom. John's been doing some absolutely uh, fantastic work over the last few years on uh, using clinical variables to uh, predict uh, outcome to pharmacological interventions in uh, type two diabetes. And this morning, he's going to uh, uh, share with us some of uh, the latest results uh, from his work. So uh, without further ado, over to you, John. I'm delighted that you're here this morning and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. 
Uh, th thank, thanks, Anna, for your kind words. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon from, from the UK. Um, and um, yeah, so so I'm delighted to um, be here today to talk about some um, work. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm delighted to um, be here to sh share some work um, from Exeter in the UK on precision medicine and type 2 diabetes, um, particularly um, our work using routine clinical features to optimise selection of glucose lowering treatment. Um, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, so really the vision for this work is shown in, in the slide here. Uh, we have patients like Beryl and Anthony um, in the clinic who require additional treatment uh, to control their blood sugar levels. And um, the idea of a type two precision medicine approach is to see whether we can use the, their routinely collected clinical information. So things that doctors measure anyway in these patients um, and use this information to target treatment. And the end goal is to develop models or decision aids that we can implement in clinical care uh, to support clinical decision making. Uh, so why is this um, approach needed? Um, and really the main reason is that for many patients, choice of glucose lowering treatment is still a major clinical dilemma. Uh, there's multiple treatment options available after metformin as shown here. And really a key point is that um, clinical guidelines um, are not consistent across the world. So here in the UK, we have NICE guidelines, which differ to the American and European guidelines. Um, in particular, the, uh, the latter recommend specific GLP-1 or SGLT-2 treatments uh, for subgroups of patients with uh, pre-existing cardiovascular or renal disease. However, studies have estimated that, that this group really represents only about 15 to 20% of people in routine practice. So that means for 80 to 85% of people, we still have no clear guidance on what the best drug after metformin is. Um, and a consequence of this is um, really large differences in second line prescribing. So here we can compare data from the UK in US on second line treatment initiations. And we can see in the UK, we have a much greater use of DPP-4 inhibitors and SGLT2s, but um, a lower use of GLP-1 um, and sulfonylurea treatments. Um, we've also looked at variation within um, England as well. And on the left, you can see that Although metformin prescribing is reasonably consistent across the country, reflecting its position as the first line treatment of choice, for second line uh, drugs, the picture really is more mixed with marked variation in prescribing, particularly for newer agents. And really, it seems very unlikely that this, these geographical differences reflect differences in the clinical need of patients. Um, and so one solution is a precision medicine approach. So targeting treatment at those patients more likely to benefit. And this is something we've been working at on ex in Exeter for some years now, uh, using the research framework shown here. So conducting discovery analysis in large routine data sets such as GP records. So testing for clinical markers associated with differential drug response. Um, taking advantage of the fact that these large routine data sets have information on all the different drug classes um, in tens or even hundreds of thousands of patients. Um, and as well, by using these routine data sets, we're restricted to covariate set that doctors measure anyway. So meaning any precision me medicine methodology developed um, can then be implemented at low cost for patients. However, as we all know, there are substantial biases working with routine data, in particular, the likely systematic differences between patients receiving different drugs. So our critical second step is to take what we found in the routine clinical data and test it in replication analysis of existing clinical trials, which are now increasingly available through portals such as Yoda. Um, and the first implementation of this approach uh, 
we published in Diabetes Care a couple of years ago, looking at SU and TZD therapy. Um, and in the routine GP data, we were able to identify simple subgroups defined by the characteristics of sex and obesity. Um, so a subgroup of non-obese males were identified as having a, a increase HbA1c reduction at 12 months uh, compared to TZDs, whereas obese females we saw the opposite pattern, so a greater 12-month response on TZD treatment than SU. Um, and when we tested these simple subgroups in clinical trial data from the ADOPT study, we found these differences held up. So non-obese males having a much greater, especially early reduction on SU treatment, whereas obese females having a much greater and more sustained response on TZD. Um, so clearly in illustrating the principle of using routine clinical features to identify patients who are likely to have a marked glycemic benefit on one drug over another. Uh, so we've since been um, extending this work to look at newer treatments, in particular SGLT2 and DPP4s. Um, and again, we start in routine data, so 26,000 patients in UK primary care, and we're looking for candidate features associated with differential drug response, so differential being the key word. Um, for example, if we look at something like male sex, we can see that actually males seem to have a at least in these observational data, a slightly greater response um, than females to both drugs. And what this means is that although this is associated with response, it's not a differential factor, so it's likely not useful for selecting treatment. However, if we look at EGFR, we can actually see um, a evidence of a differential effect. So higher EGFR, being associated with greater response to SGLT2s, but lesser response to DPP4 inhibitors. So as the associations go in the different direction, we can potentially use EGFR to target treatment. However, as you can see here, there are lots of candidate features potentially associated with differential response, and the individual, individual effect sizes are relatively modest. So we we need to move beyond subgroups and think of ways of integrating continuous clinical features um, for precision medicine. And um, a, a schematic of how you can do this, extending our previous framework is shown here. So starting with the development data set, so GP records in this case, um, use the biological and clinical information of people with type 2 to develop models to predict response for each individual patient on each drug of interest, so drug A and drug B here. And then um, for the patient in green, we can see that there's evidence for greater response on drug A, so we can identify the predicted optimal treatment for that patient accordingly. Um, the next step is to transport the model into an independent test data set, ideally from a randomized clinical trial. And again, we use, we use the model to identify two groups. One that is predicted to be optimal on drug A and one that's predicted to be optimal on drug B. We can then, <clears throat> and this is the critical evaluation step, take advantage of the fact that by chance, some of the patients on in the drug A optimal group will have ended up on drug A, so concordant patients, whereas others will have ended up on drug B, so discordant. And if our prediction model to, for treatment selection has utility, we would expect to see a greater response um, on drug A than drug B when comparing these groups, and vice versa for the drug B optimal group. So now applying this framework for SGLT2s and DPP4s, we developed a model based on um, five simple clinical features. Um, this is as, as yet unpublished work. Um, and when we did this, we found clear evidence of potential heterogeneity in um, glycemic reduction for individual patients. So this is a histogram of the predicted individual treatment difference. To the left of zero favors this SGLT2, to the right favors DPP4. And what we can see is for, for the vast majority 
Um, the model predicts that SGLT2 will be the optimal treatment for, for you know, over nearly 84% 80, of patients, whereas there's a much smaller group who may benefit on DPP4s. Uh, when we take this to our test environment, so trial data, um, we can see that we see um, a similar predicted individual treatment effect. And when we assign the individual patients into the optimal subgroups and then use our concordant discordant approach to assess utility, we see that indeed the patients in the DPP4 optimal group have a, um, have a glycemic benefit if they did receive S DPP4 treatment compared to SGLT2. And in the SGLT2 optimal group, those who received SGLT2s had a better average response than those who received DPP4s. Um, now, the clinical um, relevance of the effect sizes shown here are, are, are clearly arguable. Um, however, what we're then able to do is to drill down deeper into the data, and in particular focus on this particular quite large subgroup with a greater than five millimolar predicted SGLT2 benefit. And when we do this, we can then look at their observed outcome, and we can see that this group represents 40% of patients in clinical practice, and that across three independent validation data sets, the observed treatment benefit on SGLT2 for that group was well in excess of 5 millimoles per mole. So this is clearly identifying a patient subgroup who have a marked glycemic benefit on SGLT2 treatment over DPP4s. When we look at the pattern of difference across the other subgroups, we can see that this fairly closely matches those predicted by our model. Um, of course, I've, I've talked about HbA1c as, as um, our main outcome here, but of, of course we need to consider other aspects of diabetes treatment. Uh, to support decision making. So we can use the same framework to evaluate other short term outcomes for patients. So here we can define those same subgroups by predicted glycemic benefit and um, compare six month weight change um, across the groups. And what we can see here is that for SGLT2s, we see this consistent weight change benefit of a loss of three to four kilos, regardless of their um, glycemic benefit. And this is much greater than that seen on DPP-4s. Um, things get more interesting when we look at treatment discontinuation as a prox at, within six months as a proxy of likely tolerability. Um, and we can see here for the groups predicted to have a SGLT2 benefit, actually risk of discontinuation on each therapy is very similar. However, um, when we look at the subgroups with a benefit in terms of HbA1c on DPP4s, we can see evidence of potentially clinically relevant differences in discontinuation. So this group with a predicted benefit of over three millimole per mole on DPP4s, having half the risk of discontinuation within six months if they actually received a DPP-4 compared to if they actually received an SGLT-2. Um, so you can see here how we've used just these simple routine features to identify major subgroups um, who have clinically relevant differences in outcome and which could support decisions on optimal treatment. Um, finally, I'd just like to co contrast this approach, which is based on continuous features integrated into models, with the other prevailing approach in, type, in diabetes at the moment, which is the idea of def using biological and clinical information to uh, define pathophysiology define, um, based subtypes. So instead of using the information to predict outcome directly, using it to assign subtypes and then contrasting risk of different outcomes between the different groups identified. And in um, recent work we published in Lancet Diabetes, we compared the recently proposed Scandinavian based clusters um, with our individualized prediction approach for assessing 
um, HbA1c reduction and optimal treatment. And again, using this concordant and discordant framework, we were able to show that the clusters had some utility, as shown by a, around about a two millimole per mole increased response in the concordant versus discordant group. However, using just four simple routine features, so not the HOMA variables used for the clusters, we see a much greater effect size and benefit in the concordant group using just these simple features. Um, so to conclude, um, type 2 type, there's clear potential for type 2 diabetes precision medicine approaches based on routine clinical features. Uh, we now have very good evidence that simple clinical features are robustly associated with differential HbA1c response for um, most drugs after metformin. The next step is to integrate these um, features into models that can uh, differentiate in terms of HbA1c between different outcomes, as well as to incorporate, apply the same approach to incorporate other endpoints, in particular risks of therapy. Um, with SGLT2s and DPP4s, we can pick out a important subgroup of about 40% of patients who really do have a marked HbA1c benefit on SGLT2s, and a, another subgroup who have potentially an increased response with DPP4s, but and also a much lower risk of discontinuation on these treatments. Methodologically, um, the concordant discordant approach offers a practical, low way, low cost way of evaluating precision medicine strategies, as well as comparing them, and can be implemented for um, all other clinically relevant patient endpoints beyond HbA1c and the short term side effects. And lastly, um, we've deployed this concordant discordant approach to show that continuous clinical measures are always likely to outperform approaches that um, use clinical features to define pathophysiology, to find hard subgroups in, when we're thinking about clinical utility for individual patients. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Exeter colleagues and um, colleagues at the Alan Turing Institute and on the Mastermind Consortium. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John, for the amazing talk. So the next speaker will be um, Satya Dash. Dr. Satya Dash is an assistant professor at University of Toronto, and he will be discussing with us today um, aspects of bariatric surgery, which could really help us uh, guide our management for uh, diabetes. So I would ask uh, and remind all the speakers to stay on time so that we'll have ample time for discussion at the end and uh, remind all the participants to continue to upload questions. Over to you, Satya. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Mina. And I'm just gonna stop my slides. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be invited uh, to speak here. So I'd like to thank the organizers uh, uh, of this particular meeting. These are my uh, pertinent uh, disclosures. And I'd also like to thank my funders. I'll be presenting mostly uh, unpublished uh, data today. So I would prefer no photography, please. Now, my major clinical and research interest uh, is in obesity, which increases the risk for metabolic diseases, such as uh, insulin resistance and type two diabetes. Now, as a result of this, it also increases the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And increasingly, we know that obesity is independently associated with heart failure. And cardiovascular disease is the number one cause for morbidity and mortality in patients with obesity. However, obesity is a multi-system disease, so pretty much every system is affected. Uh, and weight loss can improve many of these comorbidities and in some cases remit them. For example, five to 10% weight loss can improve multiple metabolic parameters, but with greater weight loss, typically in the range of uh, 15 to 20% or higher, one can potentially start to see reversal uh, of these comorbidities. However, obesity is highly heritable, and in the current environment, many people struggle to lose weight. And when people do lose weight, various endocrine adaptations make it very difficult to sustain weight loss. 
For example, you can get a reduction in leptin, and this leads to increased energy efficiency and increased drive to eat. And therefore, many people regain weight after losing it. And for now, the most effective treatment for sustained weight loss is bariatric surgery. For people with type 2 diabetes, this can lead to an average reduction of 2% in hemoglobin A1c over 5 to 10 years. We now have long-term data from various clinical trials. And about 25 to 30% of these patients will have long-term remission of type 2 diabetes. But it has a further additional uh, benefits. It can improve and remit hypertension, sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and dyslipidemia. Now, worldwide, the two most common uh, bariatric surgical procedures are the rouen y gastric bypass and the uh, sleeve gastrectomy. In Ontario, where I practice, uh, gastric bypass is the most common. But in the US, increasingly, sleeve gastrectomy uh, is becoming more common and is the number one procedure. The sleeve gastrectomy is a restrictive procedure, whereas the gastric bypass is both restrictive and malabsorptive. The data to date suggests that rouen y gastric bypass is likely superior to sleeve gastrectomy for both weight loss and type 2 diabetes remission, at least at the one year point. As I mentioned earlier, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause for death in people with obesity. And encouragingly, recent observational data suggests that bariatric surgery reduces cardiovascular disease, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes and those with established cardiovascular disease. However, most people who are referred for bariatric surgery are largely free of cardiovascular disease, and most of them actually do not have type 2 diabetes. Data from the Swedish obesity study suggests that in this uh, patient group, without type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, uh, bariatric surgery does have cardiovascular disease reduction effects. However, a couple of caveats here. The most commonly uh, performed procedure in that study was the vertical banded gastroplasty, which is not routinely performed now. Further, this study was conducted between 1987 and 2002, and since then, we have become more aggressive with uh, addressing cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension and lipids. And so we were interested in, this, in assessing the cardiovascular disease benefits of bariatric surgery in this particular patient group, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But the big problem, despite all the benefits of bariatric surgery, the big problem is patient attrition. Ontario has a universal healthcare system, but 63% of eligible patients who agree to bariatric surgery subsequently change their mind. The number goes up even more for people with type 2 diabetes. 70% of eligible patients who in the last 10 years from our institute changed their mind about undergoing bariatric surgery after referral. And the leading reason for that is they're fearful of undergoing an invasive procedure. So they have safety concerns. And so we asked the question, what are the long-term outcomes in these people? And in particular, what are the cardiovascular disease outcomes? And we thought that this analysis would also be able to answer the previous question that I raised, does bariatric surgery reduce cardiovascular disease in people without type 2 diabetes? And here are our results. We uh, analyzed data from the full cohort, those without type 2 diabetes and those with type 2 diabetes. And reassuringly, bariatric surgery was associated with reduced cardiovascular disease uh, in people with and without type 2 diabetes. Overall, it was associated with reduced chronic kidney disease. A subsection of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, had worsening of their liver disease, but this was just a very small number. So overall, bariatric surgery was beneficial. So I hope that this persuades uh, more people to have the procedure when they're referred. Of course, this is observational data, and there is a lot of interest in randomized controlled trial to see whether bariatric surgery does have cardiovascular disease benefits. Now, as we've heard throughout this conference, uh, type 2 diabetes is a very heterogeneous uh, condition with variable contributions from insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. However, for a substantial number of patients, 
the first uh, abnormality in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance, and this is often driven by obesity. Subsequently, over time, there is progressive beta cell dysfunction, which ultimately leads to hyperglycemia and type 2 diabetes. Now, one of the major reasons why people with obesity develop insulin resistance is compromised adipose storage capacity. Normally, excess calories are safely stored in subcutaneous adipose tissue, but with increasing weight, adipose storage capacity is exceeded. The body mass index at which this uh, occurs will vary from person to person and is largely genetically determined. This then leads to ectopic lipid deposition in the liver and muscle causing insulin resistance. And there's growing appreciation that lipid deposition in the pancreas can cause beta cell dysfunction. Reassuringly, weight loss can reverse this ectopic lipid deposition and improve metabolic health. Now, there have been a number of purported uh, mechanisms by which bariatric surgery achieves type 2 diabetes remission. But the available evidence suggests that the majority of the benefits, at least early on, are conveyed by simple caloric restriction, as people who lose an identical amount of weight through caloric restriction have very similar glycemic benefits. Now, in people undergoing bariatric surgery, most people uh, reach the nadir weight about one, to, uh, one year to 18 months after surgery. So this is a good window of, uh, of opportunity to study the impact of weight on type 2 diabetes. Now, women are often underrepresented in research studies. And one of the other advantages of studying people undergoing bariatric surgery is that 70 to 75% of patients are female. So this patient cohort can potentially give unique insights into the etiology of type 2 diabetes and its remission. Now, as I alluded to earlier, uh, uh, there is progressive beta cell dysfunction in many patients with type 2 diabetes, and many of them will start off with metformin and then progress, and eventually uh, they will uh, be put on insulin. And based on this, one would assume that early intervention increases the likelihood of type 2 diabetes remission, and indeed, that is the case. Increasing age, hemoglobin A1c, number of diabetes medications, and, and in particular, insulin use, along with duration of type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, adversely uh, affect type 2 diabetes remission. Now, the first four parameters have been incorporated into a clinical prediction tool called DIRAM. There are other uh, clinical prediction tools, such as advanced DIRAM, which also incorporate duration of type 2 diabetes. Now, these clinical prediction tools generally perform very well. However, as we will see, there's, there is substantial heterogeneity in the response. So we looked at uh, data from our institute over the last three to four years, and our data was very similar to that, or that in the published literature. We have uh, type 2 diabetes remission rates at one year of approximately 60%. Now, the differences in between uh, people who achieve remission and do, do not is not due to preoperative BMI or percentage weight loss, which was similar. As expected, the DIRM score was much higher in people who did not achieve remission. Now, the DIRM score, one typically gets a score between 0 and 22. The higher the score, the less likely you are to achieve remission. And then these scores are then uh, placed into five categories. Now, if you were to look at uh, people who achieved type 2 diabetes remission, the majority of them were in categories 2 and 3. We did not have any patients in category 1, suggesting that perhaps we're operating on these patients at a later stage. But importantly, approximately 25% of patients are in categories four and five. So these are categories where one would uh, predict that type two diabetes would not remit. Equally, if one were to look at patients who did not achieve remission, as predicted, the majority, more than 50%, are in categories four and five. But a substantial number of patients, approximately 45%, are in categories two and three. If one were to look at percentage of patients on insulin, 
Remarkably, 25% of people on insulin achieve remission. Equally, almost 50% of people who are on oral agents do not achieve remission. So understanding why people who are predicted to have low likelihood of type 2 diabetes remission achieve remission and vice versa will be very important in understanding the etiology of type 2 uh, diabetes. We think that genetic factors are very important here, and that is something that we are actively looking at, and we recently uh, received funding from CIHR to do that. But we're also looking at uh, biochemical markers. And one of the interesting things that we found is that ALT was significantly higher preoperatively in people who achieved uh, type 2 diabetes remission. We've heard about ALT uh, before uh, uh, in this conference. We heard it in the last talk, and we also heard it yesterday when, we were talk uh, when uh, youth with uh, type 2 diabetes were being discussed. This is a surrogate marker of hepatic steatosis and insulin resistance. So perhaps people who are more predominantly insulin resistant benefit from bariatric surgery, but obviously this needs to be uh, confirmed. So in summary, bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment for obesity and type 2 diabetes. It is underutilized. The glycemic effects are predominantly mediated by weight loss. Early intervention is associated with increased likelihood of type 2 diabetes remission, but there is considerable heterogeneity in response, which can potentially provide important insights into the etiology of type 2 diabetes. And to end, I'd like to thank all the study participants, people in my group and my collaborators uh, in Toronto, as well as all the funders that I had listed uh, previously. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Satya. So uh, we now move on to our third speaker of this morning. Um, I'm uh, delighted to introduce Dr. Wen Lu Zhao from uh, Tempus, where she's the head of translational endocrinology. Um, and Dr. Zhao has actually trained uh, with our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Snyder at Stanford before taking up this position uh, in industry where she really is leading uh, uh, the research on using multi-omics, um, uh, for uh, metabolic phenotyping. Um, and today she's going to tell us some of uh, the exciting work that's coming out of uh, Tempus in this space. Um, I'd just like to remind all speakers to uh, do their best to uh, stick to their allotted time and uh, give you a little heads up that Mina and I will be turning on our cameras to try and give you a visual cue that you're close to the end uh, of your session. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Wen, uh, Wen Yu. And thanks, Dr. Gleon, for this very nice talk and introduction. And also thanks for the like uh, events organizer for organizing such a great events and also inviting me. Um, today, it's my honor to present my research and done under Michael, Dr. Michael Slider's mentorship. And this is about uh, using the multi-omics profiling to really looking at the individual like uh, differences and especially their response to their those various uh, environmental triggers. Um, and in the last, I will talk about like how um, the industry is approaching and those uh, heterogeneity in this disease. And then um, my, my presentation was fine taking photos for non-commercial non use. So, um, so today I'd like to show that um, given the uh, huge amount of the heterogeneity in this disease, and I'd like to propose that the molecular um, multi-omics profiling can give us a very systematic and unbiased view, especially coupled with the longitudinal like, profiling. And this is very important to really define the personalized health references to really understand the baseline of individuals before we look at uh, their like, uh, disease, like, uh, um, um, disease uh, derivation from the health baselines. And because of the defining the baselines here, we are able to find a better um, response to those uh, very the various uh, triggers in the metabolic states. And in the end, I want to show that how those um, host and micro microbial uh, interactions change to those uh, perturbations. Um, I want to mention that um, I will go into show lots of data, but even that we are still scratching the surface. And, and there are many challenges we like to we have to face while we are thinking transitioning into industry or clinical implications. 
Um, the approach we were taking um, back um, in Dr. Slider's group is to really profile those individual molecules very well by using the card, like the state of R omics profiling techniques. And those had been shown in multiple um, publications for various, um, various applications. Um, particularly, we are all looking at starting from the uh, genomics and um, genetics by looking at their whole genome and sequencing data. And beyond that, we like to know what are the functional rate of the genetics by looking at the protein and the, like, uh, the genome-wide protein um, expression and also metabolites and abundancy from the plasma samples. And also looking at how those genes are actually expressed as a RNA in the PBMC. And in addition to that, as we know that diabetes is a multifactorial disease, not only infected by genetics, but also in heavily influenced by the environmental changes. So to that end, we are also profiling those uh, microbiome presence in various uh, sites of the body, trying to capture how those uh, microbiome changes um, to those uh, disease states. And the study I'm particularly present today and uh, uh, the cohort of uh, pre-diabetics people as well as a healthy control. And we profiled them longitudinally over um, the last, right now last probably seven or nine years. But before the, but for the published study, it's uh, talking about the data for four to five years. And uh, so for those uh, individual co patients in the cohort, we are profi we are we are monitor them, especially um, particularly when they are healthy, like four times in a year, trying to capture the dynamics of their healthy profiles. And in addition to that, um, we also profile more intensively when they are get an uh, environmental perturbation such as a virus infection and so on. The idea is that to really understand how those uh, pre-diabetic people progress, like progress into their diabetic states and also how they could be different from like different subtype of those uh, pre-diabetic people, namely insulin sensitive or insulin resistant subjects. So um, in the end of the study, we are really building those uh, multi and dimensional data sets for this cohort, where um, this is about um, 100 patients, either pre-diabetic or healthy, and we are tracking them longitudinally with those uh, sampling and, uh, and by those uh, multi-molecular uh, measurements and trying to understand how they are really um, compare, like different in terms of their progression. And in the end of the day, we are trying to look at those uh, multi omics big data and in a various way, um, trying to understand what's the difference and what are the common features. So the first of all, I like to talk about the source of variations of those cohort. Um, as we imagine, there are multiple sources, and the first one starting with the subject levels. So those are the ones that are different between individuals. And also there are components coming from temporal dynamics. Those are longitudinal variations, for example, the sample intervals or perturbation that the patient has been sampled. In the end, we have other like unknown or known um, variation introduced by, for example, the technical um, like a variation that introduced by the, those various omics assays. And also the patient were taking different diets, activity, and they also have a facing different environmental influence. So um, here I'm showing two example, two extreme um, and variations we normally see in our data sets. The one on the left, um, so here, first of all, um, it's a dimensional, like a dimension reduction space where um, the color presents different individuals and the dots with the same color presents the sample taking from the same patients. So on the, on the left, the, pen, the, the graph really shows that uh, the, sample, sa the sample from individual patients, they are actually, their profile grouped together where you see a clear um, boundary of those different um, samples from in the same individual. While on the right, the samples from taken from the individual, they actually merge together and they are, there's no difference between like different individuals. And to quantify how those uh, different samples um, coming from various, various individuals, how their variation was taken by the personal difference, 
we were using those uh, interperson variation coming from those linear mixed effect models, trying to use the ICC, which is uh, intra-class correlation, to quantify the effect of those uh, in the, the, the variation seen or our data coming from the personal difference. So, so basically, the more and the higher ICC value is, the better the, the personal difference explains the overall variations. Um, here I'm showing that by looking at all those uh, uh, cross multi-omics profiling and showing their ICC values um, for all those uh, analysis. So each dot here now presents individual variable that are measured in each different omics assays. For example, the clinical labs, we are looking at uh, about 50 um, variables over there, including A1C and some of the LIPI panels. And the transcripts, we are looking at uh, more than 20,000 different transcripts in the PBMC. Um, so, so there are a few um, uh, notes I'm taking here. First of all, comparing the typical um, functional readouts for the genomics, that will be transcripts and protein and metabolites. We observe that metabolites actually have the, the most um, personal variations compared to protein and transcripts. And which is which makes sense as metabolites is uh, like uh, the end of products of the um, and translation of the gen gen genomics. And in terms of uh, comparing the microbials, the presence or abundance of the microbials versus their actual micro predicted microbial genes, uh, we also see that the, the, the presence and abundance of the microbials actually is um, more variable compared to their predictive microbial genes, uh, which means that probably each, of, each one of us will have a different um, uh, taxonomy of those microbials, but in general, they are doing similar things among our people. Um, so using the top and those uh, top variable um, um, measurements from those uh, large cohort data sets, um, especially those uh, most expand, explained by those the personal difference. Here, I'm showing that we can actually um, define the personal health baseline very well. Um, again, in this uh, dimension reduct, uh, reduction maps, here I'm showing that again, dots presenting samples from the patients and patients are giving different colors. So here I'm showing that there are individual actually are very well defined in their own space. And, uh, and uh, there are also other people in this, in this uh, space that actually have a pretty clean, clear and tight boundary of their healthy references. Um, um, so one thing, uh, one thing I wanna like to mention with our cohort and also profiling study is that um, it's actually, it's um, potentially we can do correlation out of those cohort. And the potential correlation we are doing is actually different um, between the cross-sectional versus longitudinal cohort. For example, here are two examples. Um, at the cohort level, this is an example between um, fasting glucose and the average A1C levels. Again, the dot here presenting different patients. Uh, uh, if we are looking at the cross-sectional cohort, we, uh, when we're looking at the correlation between glucose and A1C, we can very clearly say that when the average and the patient have an average higher A1C, also have average higher fasting glucose. However, when we are looking at the correlation at the individual level, meaning that each individual actually contribute to have, have multiple um, those uh, fasting glucose and A1C taken over the time, and we are looking at with the individual how their glucose and A1C correlated, actually we don't see any uh, correlation between those uh, two measurements which also makes sense given that the fasting glucose is more dynamic, reflect, reflecting short-term glycemic and dynamics, while A1C is more stable of reflecting the three months average. Um, so I wanna mention that because of the nature of our data, and we are mainly focusing on looking at the correlation at the individual level, basically looking at how those various sampling were correlating with each other within individuals. 
And I want to mention that both correlation provide different perspectives, and uh, they are giving us a different different like uh, um, values in terms of thinking about the underlying biology. So for that, one one of the important thing we want to um, study in this study in in this uh, research is to find out how a microbiome and the host um, profile really interact with each other. And we are doing that comparing the insulin sensitive subject versus insulin resistant subject. So here on the first row, I'm showing that two um, microbiome species, Barcelona and uh, faculty bacteria versus their relationship with the uh, two uh, human cytokines circulating in the blood. One is the IL-1 beta and one is the TNF alpha. So again, I'm doing longitudinal correlation here. I'm showing that uh, so for the two bacteria showing here and the, the two human cytokines, they are tightly correlated and in a way that in working synergy trying to enhance the immune regulation only seen in the insulin sensitive subject. However, the link is missing in the insulin resistant subject. And because of the ability to really define the personal baseline using all those multi-omics uh, profilings, um, here we actually seeing a better or more, um, a more delineated pathway response um, when we look at those patient response to the immunization or infection. And so this is a, a sub the event, a sub cohort of our patient has uh, has encountered where we sample them more frequently during the course of the infection. And so we have a pre health and baseline, and we also have a post health um, like a profile. So during the the course we have uh, like a three categorical sampling time, which is early the events early events late and uh, recovery early that span the different timeline of the, 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 the course. So we want to address that, what are the molecular patterns that are, we can observe in response to those respiratory viral infection? And out of all those different layers of the functional readout, uh, multi-omics profiling, which one are most responding? And in the end, and how does the insulin resistance, resistance subject really and like uh, show different response, different different re different show response. And to that end, uh, I want to present two patterns, and we observe in this uh, sub cohort. And um, so here again, the timeline is the early events, late and recovery, and the post healthy state, and everything is normalized to the pre health baseline. And we see definitely um, beyond those two patterns, we have more patterns. Uh, those are the two major patterns um, that we see here. One is that decreasing the abundancy or expression during the infection, a, lot, a larger one is reversed. And, we, from, and in those two different patterns, we observe various contributions from either human or microbial um, like, uh, um, profiles and indicating that uh, there could be very tight coordination between like a host profile versus those uh, microbial factors. Um, so one key message we actually like to present here is how, so as, as you may imagine, all, doing all those uh, multi-omics pro, um, profiling is very expensive, but how does, what's the value of those uh, multi-omics uh, profile really reviews? Um, here I'm showing that in the, um, in the prediction modeling, we want to demonstrate that like uh, when we're trying to predict um, patients um, status, either like from in, like using infection from the healthy business, um, what are the um, omics and contributions? And we do have a very uh, like um, quantification for those different layers. And in the end, we also are able to show that insulin sensitive subject have a more like a, accurate or like a sensitive response to the infection. And in the end, um, in the end, um, we also demonstrate one particular case where we only track the patients over the time, capture multiple, multiple, multiple healthy baselines before the patient progress into diabetes. And we are able to show that different like uh, cytokine profile in this stage and we show that a group of cytokines are only responsive to the, when the patient have an antibiotic intake 
uh, of group of them are only like sensitive while the is closer to the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And in the end, and we are showing that by taking the signal from multi-omics, we are able to show that there indeed has a very tight synergy between the host micro, the host profile and also the microbound in of this patient, especially in the journey of those uh, um, patients while they pro pro process into the diabetes. So, uh, so given the um, distinct but yet complementary perspectives of those uh, multi-omics approach, and the concepts of those uh, multi-model, especially coupled with longitudinal monitor, really translate well in the industry or biotech industry that I'm now. And the idea is that to really capture multi-model, not only from genomics, but also from those uh, like uh, various layers of molecular profile, and also coupled with those uh, clinical data, either from the EMR or from the clinical trial, and also and, and looking at the real world data sets, trying to understand how to really integrate them together, have a more comprehensive um, understanding of the patient on its own, especially in their journey response to different like uh, ther therapy treatment. So in the end, and uh, those are my take home image. And I, because I'm time running out, but uh, uh, as you imagine, like uh, all those uh, multi-omics profiling are very expensive, especially when we think about translate into the clinical implementations, we have to really think about what are the costs and how to really uh, make it uh, tailored to those individual patient care. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. I wanna thank the, all the people in the Snyder Lab, our collaborations, and thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that excellent talk. Uh, we move on now to uh, our next speaker, who's um, had a, a great introduction from Dr. Zhao already. Um, and the next speaker is Professor Mike Snyder, who's the Professor and Chair of Genetics at the University of uh, Stanford, and has really played a, a central a role in uh, bringing um, omics um, uh, over at the uh, longitudinal study into diabetes. And I'm excited to hear uh, what he has to tell us about the, the IPOP study and beyond. Over to you, Mike. All right, uh, thanks, great to be here. Um, and what I wanna do is build on what Wenyu was telling you about um, our work to use big data to better characterize diabetes, as well as bring in some other studies we've been doing with continuous glucose monitoring. So as when you mentioned, um, we're very interested in trying to use big data, uh, gather data from all different sources to better track and understand and, and uh, ideally um, improve people's health. And so we've been um, doing this deep profile that when you mentioned, I won't get into this, but it's most deluxe forms, we'll measure 14 different ohms on people, genome once, but the others we mentioned, we measure longitudinally. Uh, for most people, it's about seven or eight different ohms. We do deep clinical testing and, and wearables, uh, and I'll be talking about some of that today. So just to build on what Wen Yu was telling you, we're very interested in seeing whether these technologies can be used to better, uh, as they say, manage people's health. And just from the first three plus years of, of um, data, we actually had from this cohort of 109 people, 49 major health discoveries. Now it is an older cohort, 53.4 uh, median age entering the study, but nearly half the people learned something pretty important about their health and nearly all cases pretty symptomatically. And some of these were a big deal like uh, lymphoma, some precancers, uh, two people with serious heart issues and so on. Uh, with regards to this particular you know, workshop, but we learned quite a bit around diabetes. Uh, nine individuals were thought to have type two diabetes coming in, one turns out to be a Modi individual. Um, and so <clears throat> actually switch medications as a consequence. Uh, and then we actually discovered people getting diabetes as they were getting it. And in fact, that was one of the big goals of the study was to try and understand how do people really become type two diabetic at a personal level? Do they just gradually get there? Do they spike their way in? What's going on? And, and you'll see why I say that in a minute. So coming into the study, as I say, nine people knew they were diabetic. It turns out two others were diabetic who didn't know it. And this is no surprise, but there were a lot of people who are pre-diabetic who had no idea, and that's very common. Nine out of 10 pre-diabetics don't know it. And of course, we think that's important because 70% of those will go on and become diabetic in their lifetime. So during this first four years of, of 
uh, study, actually nine others became clinically diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and others had diabetic range values, and of course, others became pre-diabetic. So again, how do people become type 2 diabetic? And I should point out, uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, by the way, I'm, I'm totally conflicted. I'm involved with all kinds of companies, so you can disregard everything I'm telling you if you like. Um, anyway, so how do people become type 2 diabetic? So for the nine who became clinically diagnosed as diabetic, two got there in what I'll call classical means. Uh, they, they basically gained weight. And then as when you pointed out, their microbiome diversity dropped. And, and um, you know, that would be a very typical way. But the other seven didn't gain weight at all. And five of the seven just gradually became diabetic. Um, so, for example, um, this one here, uh, orange is, is fasting glucose, this gray line is hemoglobin A1C. This person gradually went up and they first became official. He diagnosed with fasting glucose, although they did hit there with, with hemoglobin A1C. This person was first diagnosed with oral glucose tolerance tests. And, and so on and so forth. They each became differently. And these actually measure slightly different things, as I'm sure you realize, and probably reveal different mechanisms of what's going on. But what was interesting was that two people actually spiked their way into diabetes. And I'm one of the two. I've been profiling me for over 11 years now. Um, and um, this is actually me with eight years of data, very extensive profiling. Uh, and I first became diabetic actually after fairly nasty viral infection, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, where I actually uh, discovered it because I went in for insulin resistance tests. My, even my fasting glucose was high. We repeatedly came out high again. And when measured later, bottom line is I hit um, hemoglobin A1C of 6.5, was officially diagnosed as diabetes. I know this looks like a blip, but that's actually about 10 months of data. Uh, and in fact, I did a whole lifestyle change where I cut out all sugars, uh, doubled my biking, started running, and I gradually got it down after about 10 to 12 months to normal levels. And in fact, it was so boringly low, I stopped looking at it. And ironically, uh, it was here. Someone else looked at it and said, Mike, your hemoglobin A1C is 7.0. Uh, and we went back and looked at, at what, what was going on. And it um, turns out that... Um, I had stopped running and also got a nasty viral infection here as well. So we're not sure what triggered this for sure. But um, bottom line is uh, uh, I was back to diabetic again. By the way, I'm not, I wouldn't classify myself as overweight, nor would anyone else. So I started running again. I could bring it down, but I never got it all the way down to that baseline. I get down to five, seven initially and gradually kept creeping up as this might be expected a little faster than I would have liked. So I was running about as much as I could, four to five miles, a, you know, uh, uh, a day, or sorry, four times a week, four to five miles a shot. Uh, and then I decided to switch from um, running to weightlifting with the idea that muscle mass might increase better homo glucose homeostasis. And that actually failed miserably. I did gain 10 pounds of muscle mass. I've been doing it for five years, weightlifting, but it didn't help with my glucose control. It just kept creeping up, same slope pretty much. So finally, I bit the bullet and I took metformin. And sure enough, I am metformin resistant. <laughs> so in fact, uh, it's not showing on here. I should have kept plotting it. But I went up to 7.5, in fact, because I kept thinking it would work and increasing my dose. And that didn't work. So what, what was my solution? Well, the answer was um, uh, more data. And if it turns out I'm insulin sensitive. And I'm also, uh, I do make insulin just fine. So what's my problem? I have an insulin secretion defect, which we could show through glucose disposition measurements. I'm one of the worst in the, in the cohort. And it turns out then the obvious solution for me was rapinolide, and I'm not pronouncing it right, but that actually works pretty well for me. And um, so it's actually brought my hemoglobin A1C to low sixes. I'm working on other ways to get it lower. So the point out of all this, this is, I think relates very, very nicely to to what um, was stated earlier, that uh, understanding mechanisms is actually pretty valuable for helping come up with the right solution for precision diabetes. And I think I'm a personal example of that. Now, people often ask me, well, what do you think is going on? How did you get that way? And it's easy to say, well, virus probably triggered it. That's very re relevant, I'm sure you know, to the current pandemic. 
where the inc incidence of type 2 diabetes is going up after COVID infection. Uh, there's now quite a few studies on that. And so we decided, um, this is pre-COVID times, to take a look at what could be going on. If you're thinking about when you get a viral infection, what does that do to you epigenetically? And I don't think that had ever been pursued before. So in my case, we just happen to have 57 time points through the first a little over three years of study. And it's this is that first glucose peak I showed you earlier. This is the second time it went up and never, I mean, when it for, yeah, became pretty high. Uh, and then we didn't have, that's the main samples we had at the time. So we actually did transcriptome analysis on all 57 time points, as well as looked at my methylome through the infections and random sampling through the non-infectious periods, 27, a very expensive experiment, whole genome bisulfite sequencing to map out methylation patterns. And this part's not a surprise. When you look at my transcriptome, each of these, I forgot to say, but I had six viral infections during this time. Now, that's a nasty one that triggered the first diabetes uh, jump up. And here's the HRV rhinovirus that triggered the second one, we think, or probably with lack of running. And anyway, every single time I had a viral infection, it's not a surprise, my transcriptome went off. And it's always your immune response genes that change. And some are common to all, uh, all six viruses that I was hit with. Some are specific, like this is just RSV. These are rhinoviruses, some are rhinovirus specific. So it'll depend on the virus, which, exactly what genes go up. But we can map all this out. But what was really cool is you look at the exact same samples. These are peripheral blood monocyte cells. Look at the exact same samples. And my methylome only really went off twice. And it went off the two times when my glucose went off. And it went off before actually the, the glucose changed. So what we think is going on, and it's not a strong difference, it's several, several percent, but it's over these methylation changes are in the promoter regions of several hundred genes, and they're, they're fairly modest, but our interpretation is that this modest effect over hundreds of metabolic genes actually triggers glucose dysregulation. And as I say, in each case, it would appear a few weeks prior to when my glucose went off. So what we think is going on is that your, your, your transcriptome is a measure of acute disease, that's no surprise, but your methylome is probably a measure of chronic disease like, like type two diabetes, and it can be altered by, we think, viral infections and things like this. So this is very relevant. I'm throwing this out there because I think it's incredibly relevant to what's going on now with COVID to see what long-term effects we might expect and how does that affect epigenetic changes. The other story I want to tell you about is I work with glucose monitors and not sure how much time, but uh, I think I can go through this pretty quickly. We're very keen on using continuous monitors for following people's health and because they follow you 24 seven, they're very, very informative about, they're, they're basically you know health monitors, if you will. Most people are using them as fitness trackers when we started this, but we're using these as health monitors. And so we have smart watches on people. I'm wearing four right now, you can probably see. Uh, and anyway, one of those things that we're studying is glucose monitoring. And, and unlike studies that we're putting in these on type one diabetics and insulin dependent type twos, we said, well, let's just put these on healthy people and pre-diabetics and a couple of diabetics. And when we did that, of course, we saw all kinds of patterns. Some people have pretty good glucose control. Some are moderate spikers after they eat, and some are what we call severe spikers. They, you know, after they eat, they spike to all kinds of things. And um, we actually wrote all algorithms to be able to better classify people. We, we grouped them into what we call glucotypes. Uh, these are the low spikers or, and medium values. These are the moderate, um, median, and levels and, and spiking levels. And then these are the more severe. And so what we discovered, of course, this is now known, but different people, I should point out a lot of these folks, these are were, were thought to be perfectly normal, including severe spikers. They're actually where people who basically thought of themselves as quite healthy. I'll come back to that in a second. But one of the things we discovered is, and, and we're doing a lot of work on this now, is that different people are spiking to different foods. Some people spike, for example, to bread and peanut butter, other protein bars, because there are carbs in here, uh, others to different things. Some people spike to pasta, some to bananas, different people spike to different foods. Nearly everybody spikes to cornflakes and milk. This is like poison. I think it should be outlawed, probably worse than smoking. Uh, but anyway, I hope no one from Kellogg's is on, but um, anyway, we we these are there's some foods out there that are really pretty nasty. I would argue for your glucose control. So um, yeah, and one of the things we discovered as well is that 
and people who are normal by fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, uh, even oral glucose tolerance tests actually are severe spikers. They're just as bad spikers as those who are classified as type 2 diabetic. So we think that probably represents different ways in which people have glucose dysfunction, something we've been digging into a lot lately. We have some new data on this now, but we can start to classify people by their, their different um, <clears throat> underlying defects, much like me. I'm, I'm a beta cell um, non-secretor, non and so my, my therapies uh, go a certain way. Now, one other story I'll throw out, and I'm totally conflicted, but I'm keeping on science. Uh, it's a study. So if you use glucose monitors, you can say, well, you know, they are amazing uh, devices, I'm sure you know, for getting people to control their glucose. Even wearing a device, it turns out we just had this paper come out this week, even wearing a device for as short as 10 days, this is a Libra, will actually improve glucose control, at least for people who are also doing food loggers. So, so this is a study run out of a, my company in January um, with 60, 665 people with good data, and we just wanted to see, do they improve their glucose simply by wearing a, a, you know, one of these continuous glucose monitors? And the answer is they do. But this replicates what I told you earlier. The numbers are a little smaller, but people who are thought to be healthy are actually often uh, pre-diabetic and some are full-blown type 2 diabetic, as a similar way I told you before. This is showing you, you the data. It turns out 90, over 90% 90 of people who are healthy will improve their time and range simply by wearing a continuous glucose monitor and also having uh, one of these food logging activity apps that can follow, that can track you. So just attend that you can get an improvement in TIR just doing this. So you're gonna wanna control for this for those of you who are doing these. And for type two diabetics, it also is still the majority, I think it's close to 60%, also showed this improvement in TIR. Again, simply over 10 days, uh, and the improvement can be pretty good for those who are actually a bad TIR, up to 23% improvement. So the other thing I'll tell you is that, again, I think these devices are going to be very, very powerful. We have, using machine learning, we can actually find a certain amount of clinical information simply from a smartwatch, actually, which you can pull in all kinds of features uh, and parameters, physiological parameters, then do machine learning and, and see how they match up against certain clinical values, like here's hemocrit, hemoglobin. And down here is the thing that should interest this crowd, hemoglobin A1C and glucose. It's not a good enough signal for clinical diagnosis, at least with these older devices, with newer ones we'll see. But it does give you some information about shifts. So we actually think these devices will be powerful for giving you early signs uh, of, what, of people who are going off, in this case, for, for blood measures from a simple smartwatch, in this case, for glucose-related measures, if you will. Uh, and we can, we've can we been building a platform to bring in all this data, clinical data, omics data, and all the wearable data into a smartphone, because we think this is going to be your most important health device in the future. Uh, we have a system set up that can handle data from millions of people now, uh, and you can display it back whatever resolution you want. And then, of course, you can share it with your physician. And we think this is going to be the future of health by bringing genome sequences with biochemical and wearable data to better manage people's health. And again, I have an amazing group. Uh, when you has led a lot of the multiomics work, but the wearables work is now being performed by quite a few others. And so uh, that's the story I wanted to tell you. Thanks again for having me. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. So our next and final speaker is Dr. Jillian Booth. Um, she's also uh, from Toronto. Um, she's a full professor at University of Toronto and uh, is an endocrinologist at St. Michael's Hospital. Um, she works as a senior scientist at the uh, ICS, um, as well as the Li Keqing uh, Knowledge Translation Institute uh, at St. Mike's. Um, she's going to go to the other full spectrum of, uh, of um, uh, big data and uh, talk to us about um, multidimensional phenotyping approaches. So Jillian, over to you. Thanks, Mina, so much. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. And uh, I don't have any disclosures to report and feel free to use a camera. Um, I'm going to speak about big data from the perspective of administrative health data and electronic health records. And 
the integration of these types of data sources with others to get more rich phenotypic data um, to understand differences across populations. And I'll also touch on initiatives to accelerate collaborations in the space, as well as some of the challenges. So our data, um, we use administrative data in the province of Ontario for nearly 14 million individuals. And we're able to look at a number of factors by linking different data sources together. And one of the advantages of the, our data and others is that it's efficient and cost effective. And you can study whole populations, which can mitigate some of the selection bias we see in cohort studies. In addition, um, most of these sort of EHR or administrative data sets are quite large. So it gives you additional power to look at subgroups in the population who are at greater risk of disease. Um, obviously, you can also look at some of these sort of standardized outcomes that are linked and followed over time, such as death records, hospitalizations, procedures, and to some extent, depending on the variable, look at some have accurate assessment of baseline data and the ability to address confounding. This is a very old study, but I'm actually just using it to set up a point. Um, this is data from Hafner and colleagues from 1998. And what they found is that if you look at the two middle bars is that people with diabetes without a history of any cardiovascular disease had the same rate of hospitalization for myocardial infarction as people in the yellow bar who were those who didn't have diabetes but had already had an MI. Um, and this kind of gave rise to the notion of diabetes as a coronary equivalent, meaning that you have a high risk of heart disease no matter who you are with diabetes and how old you are. But just to point out, this is a relatively small study, a fairly homogeneous population. And um, these were people largely with type 2 diabetes in their diabetes cohort who were middle-aged. So we were able to study 10-year admission rates for AMI in a population of over 9 million people using administrative data in Ontario. And I'll just show you them for men, first of all. But if you look at people with diabetes in the, in the uh, solid line and people without diabetes in the dash line. You can see that people with diabetes have a much higher rate of EMI admission, but they also have earlier disease, meaning we actually found that people with diabetes, um, their risk was equivalent to aging 15 years. And that was the same in people, uh, in women with diabetes as well. We were able to look at this because we could look at AMI hospitalizations in very small subsets of the population. So every five years of age, we actually had the power to look at every single year of age um, for the population. But um, so what we were able to show is that diabetes um, in people with diabetes, age is a very strong risk factor. In fact, it was the strongest risk factor. And people who were younger actually had a much lower risk of disease than we expected. This is data from the Swedish National Diabetes register and you can see life expectancy in people with type 1 diabetes in the blue lines um, versus the age match controls in red. And you can see this gap between people with type 1 diabetes and other people um, that is persistent across age groups. And actually what they found though is that this gap was bigger in people with type 1 diabetes who were diagnosed before the age of 10 for reasons that were not entirely clear, but you can't really look at a phenomenon like this unless you have very accurate um, ascertainment of diagnosis states. Um, and in this case, they had a very long look back window to do that. So we've been able to link federal immigration data to um, our health data to look at ethnicity. And what we found is that we uh, looking at the, the conversion from normal glycemia to prediabetes. Um, in this case, I'm showing you data for the adults who are 35 to 49. And you can see that not only were South Asian populations at the highest risk of converting to prediabetes, that one in three people in this population actually developed prediabetes over a 12 year period. And in terms of conversion from prediabetes to diabetes, we found that all non-European populations converted to diabetes about four to five years earlier than European populations. We don't typically have information on body mass index in our administrative health data. We do now in that we have some EMR or electronic health record data. In this case, um, this is data from Maria Chu. She linked national survey data 
to administrative data in Ontario, where there was self-reported body mass index as well as racial information. And she found that the BMI in which people, um, or the risk equivalent in terms of BMI for South Asian, Chinese, and Black populations was far lower than for whites who had a BMI of 30. So for some outcomes, you need very large data sets to have enough power. So this is called CNODES. It's the Canadian Network for Observational Drug Effects. They look at rare drug effects in seven provincial data sets and one UK database for a total population of 44 million. And they it just showing an example where they looked at the um, relationship between SGLT2 inhibitors and amputation risk and did not find an association despite there being an increased risk uh, demonstrated in the randomized trial. Another sort of emerging and exciting um, area is artificial intelligence and using machine learning to understand and predict disease outcomes. So this is data from uh, a colleague of mine, Laura Rosella, using a bunch of different data sets um, available with our administrative data in Ontario to create a machine learning algorithm for prediction of diabetes complications. And they found the model performed very well to look at complication rates and costs at three years. But they advise that this is used for health planning and not clinical care. And so one example of that is that looking at retinopathy procedures, maybe not surprising among the top risk factors that the machine learning chose were, was age and prior diabetes complications. But it also chose the number of visits to an ophthalmologist in the few years prior to getting a procedure. And that makes sense that, you know, we call that confounding by indication. So people who have um, the disease, you know, are more likely to see those specialists. And of course, that's going to predict the fact that they get those procedures. So it's a statistical predictor, not a clinical one. But as these kinds of data sets, if they can become richer and you can link more specific variables to them, then they may become useful for clinical prediction as well. Another thing that we've been able to look at is the neighborhood contextual factors, because we know that the context in which people live their lives is an important predictor of disease risk and outcomes. So we looked at urban design as a risk factor for diabetes, and we did that by studying um, linking neighborhood level data to individuals in using provincial health data, and we used their postcode of residence so that we could follow all the residents living in a given area over time for health outcomes. And if you just look at the left, we created our walkability index using a number of, of uh, data sets. For example, we use Canadian census data to look at population and residential density. We um, use map files to look at the number of connections between streets. And we overlay commercial data and other data sets to get a sense of the number of stores and services within a 10 minute walk within the boundaries around the center of a neighborhood. And one of our first studies in this area, we looked at 1.6 million adults who are middle-aged, young and middle-aged, age 30 to 64, living in Toronto. And we found that those um, both recent immigrants and longer term residents living in the least walkable area or the bottom quintile had a 30 to 50% higher likelihood of developing diabetes over five years than those living in the most walkable areas adjusting for age, sex, and area income. And we've been able to some extent adjust for what we call self-selection bias. So the fact that people who prefer to live in suburbs may be systematically different than people who choose to live in an urban area. Um, and we've done that using uh, statistical models, for example, propensity score methods, where you can uh, create weights for the population or for each individual in the population that reflects their propensity to look like somebody who lives in a high walkability area. And we did this um, using a host of variables, including demographics, comorbidities, cardiometabolic history, uh, healthcare utilization and area, um, socioeconomic status and ethnicity. And in doing that, we created balance between the two cohorts in terms of their baseline distribution of risk factors. And we found um, in all five regions that we looked at, Toronto to London, Ontario, um, we found that the highly walkable areas had a lower incidence over 10 years of diabetes. And this is specifically in those who are young and middle-aged, again, um, because that was a population that showed the biggest effect. And the pooled estimate was a hazard ratio of 0.85. 
Others have done uh, what we call natural experiments where you can actually use cohorts and follow them over time as they move from one neighborhood type to another. So for an example in this data using the National Population Health Survey data or the longitudinal cohort from that data set, um, they found that uh, people living in a low walkability area, it's shown the dashed line at the top, had consistently the highest BMI level. And of course, not ex unexpectedly, BMI went up over time as people aged. And those who moved from a low to high walkability area had a more shallow rise in uh, BMI over time. Those who lived in a highly walkable area throughout the period had, the had a lower BMI, but those who moved from a high to low saw a sharper increase in BMI over time. We've also looked at what happens to whole populations over time. Do these neighborhoods that are supposed to be protective actually slow the rise in obesity and diabetes? So this is data on uh, the adjust, this is showing the adjusted rate of overweight and obesity in the middle age, young and middle aged population living in 15 cities in southern Ontario. And what we found, if you look particularly at that orange line, which is the most walkable areas, they had a 10% lower rate of overweight and obesity. And these rates were stable over the entire 12 year period, um, as opposed to the less walkable areas, which were higher and actually went up significantly over time, although to a small degree. And in those highly walkable areas, we also saw a distinctly lower incidence of diabetes. And by linking to travel data from a transportation survey, we found that the only really main difference between the populations that we could find was their transportation cho choices. So people living in the most walkable areas had much higher numbers of walking and cycling trips per capita, higher number of um, uh, public transit trips per capita, and lower number of car trips per capita. But we've also seen differences across populations. For example, we found prediabetes incidence to be increased in low walkability neighborhoods in some, but not all ethnic groups. And we don't know if that's because of differences in health behavior. Some groups tend to walk in their neighborhoods more than others, or is that because there's other factors that are offsetting um, the risk uh, imposed by low walkability? As an example, some low walkability areas, or sorry, high walkability areas can also have other adverse health exposures. For example, high rates of NO2 concentration. So that's one of the key pollutants from, uh, from cars. This is for the city of Vancouver, just illustrating that point. And we found in Ontario cities that uh, using a, a data from an EMR database, that high walkability had an even stronger uh, effect in terms of the rate of diabetes and hypertension in the population if the neighborhood had a low rate, a low concentration of NO2. But in areas that had high concentrations of NO2, the benefits of walkability were essentially eliminated. This is actually an interesting study just demonstrating um, how much of the of obesity differences across the neighborhoods are actually explained by the built environment. In this group, what they did was they actually used satellite data to look at the built environment of neighborhoods using machine learning methods. They converted that to a digital, um, uh, sort of a digital picture as shown on the right. And then they found that 60% of the variation across neighborhoods in terms of obesity was in, explained by differences in, in the built environment. And in fact, um, if you look at the panel on the left, they found that they could recreate the map of obesity in Los Angeles using the outputs of their machine learning model based solely on the built environment. And that actually looks very much on the right, like um, observed rates obesity in the population. And they found the same thing for San Antonio on the right and a number of other cities. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on some work we did in linking environmental data to um, administrative data sets. And because of uh, potential benefits of cold exposure and insulin resistance uh, and insulin making people more insulin sensitive, um, we used data on over 500,000 pregnancies and found that there was a direct relationship between the mean 30 day temperature in, prior to gestational diabetes screening and the rate of GDM in the population with the highest rates um, in those who've been exposed to a mean temperature of over 24 degrees Celsius, um, which is, uh, I would say around almost 80, 
degrees Fahrenheit. And then those, um, the lowest rates in people who are exposed to minus 10 degrees uh, Celsius over a 30 day period. And in fact, for every 10 degree rise in temperature, the risk of GDM increased 68%. Even when we compared um, GDM risk in two consecutive pregnancies in the same woman. So there's a growing interest in linking omics data, phenotypic data, particularly lifestyle, um, BMI to these large sort of administrative or electronic health record data sets. But growing um, over time, we're gonna be able to link other environmental data to understand the context in which people live their life and how that influences the risk of disease like diabetes. And on top of that is a growing um, availability of digital data that can be linked and others have talked about this. And of course, you might be able to do that for individuals, get permission to link their health apps to their health records. But for some of these sort of data sources, we'd have to look at that in a whole population because you can't de-identify or identify people based on their, say, their smartphone tracking. Although you can look at those who live in a certain neighborhood type. And sometimes that means you have to look at whole populations. So this is an example of data from a group at Stanford and they use smartphone data on from over 700,000 individuals worldwide. And they looked at country level distribution of step counts. And they still found very interesting findings that they found that countries that had a wider step count distribution, um, what they called activity inequality, that that rate actually directly correlated with the rate of obesity in the population. So obviously there's growing interest as, as we've talked about in linking different kinds of data sources, environment, lifestyle, and biology, and examples of platforms that are trying to make that easier for researchers. For example, the All of Us Research Program, collaborative networks that have emerged to link uh, cohort data for phenotyping to biobank data for genotype and genotyping, and then obviously uh, electronic health records or other clinical data for health outcomes. The Ontario Health Study in Canada or in Ontario has collected survey data on over 200,000 individuals and blood samples on 41,000 individuals uh, for analysis. And now we have a platform linking provincial data sets from different provinces, what's called CANPATH, and they have data on over 300,000 individuals and what they recite as um, 1 billion pieces of data and growing and almost 200,000 of uh, biosamples for DNA source. So just to summarize, um, I talked on a number of benefits and limitations of using these kind of data sources. They're large size, the power to look at small subgroups or rare diseases and capture outcomes in whole populations. And you may be able to study the interplay between different risk factors or exposures, which is hard to do in smaller samples. And you can exploit what we call natural experiments. But the limitations are that we need better capture of behavioral and clinical determinants. Um, there are privacy and confidentiality issues. And in some cases, we can't link individual data to individuals um, based on these other kind of exposures. Um, and lastly, we need better standardization to allow comparisons and linkages across studies and to allow for replication of findings. So I'm going to end there and say thank you for listening from Toronto. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Booth, for a superb presentation. And thank you to all of our speakers uh, for a really diverse uh, glimpse into how we're uh, starting to uh, develop strategies for combining different types of data to understand phenotypic heterogeneity and how that influences uh, treatment. So uh, we're going to open up now for a panel discussion. Um, you guys have been uh, very busy. There are lots of uh, questions. Uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, Dr. Dennis has been very proactive in already uh, dealing with some of those, but there are some particularly interesting ones that I think we will return to because it would be good to have wider discussion around them. Um, uh, what I suggest uh, we do is that there are a couple of overarching questions that I think um, we could kick off with, and then perhaps we can go through each of the speakers and uh, pick up on some of the questions that have been directed to them individually. Um, but I wanted to kick off with a question 
question that's um, been uh, raised by Dr. Seflu in the uh, panelist uh, box around the definition that people are using for remission of diabetes, because I think this uh, speaks across all of the talks that we've heard uh, this morning, and it would be good to hear from each of the panelists how they've been defining uh, uh, remission, what glycemic parameters they're using, uh, what duration they're using for remission, and whether remission means being uh, free of medication. Um, perhaps we could go in the order of the speakers and you could just give us uh, uh, an insight into how you've been uh, defining remission for the work that you've presented this morning. So kicking off with you, Dr. Dennis. Uh, in terms of remission, that's that's not something we, we particularly focus on uh, at Exeter. So the, the, the majority of the work is around um, identifying predictors of treatment response and and other patient outcomes after initiating med medication. Okay, and do you have any comments or thoughts on how you, how it should be defined um, for, for, for our studies? Thinking about some of the direct studies that have come out of the UK over the last couple of years, um, anything you want to comment on in terms of uh, uh, how you think about it? If, if not, we can we can pass over, but I want to give you the chance to give your opinion as an expert. Uh, I'm happy to pass over on this one. It's, it's not really my area. So. Excellent, no problem at all. So um, move, moving on, um, Satya, I think you're up next. This is a good one for you. Yeah, so this is a controversial area. So for example, direct uh, uses a hemoglobin A1C cutoff of less than 6.5% uh, and at least three months off all, of, uh, all diabetes medications. And many European studies and Canadian studies use that cutoff based on the criteria that we use to diagnose type 2 diabetes, namely a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or more. Now, some US studies, for example, Stampede, they use a much stricter criteria. So they use a hemoglobin A1C cutoff of less than 6%. And then, but if you then look at some of the recent drug studies, so for example, tazapatide, a dual uh, GIP, uh, GLP-1 agonist, they looked at normalization of blood glucose as a hemoglobin A1C of less than 5.7%. Because in the US, uh, a hemoglobin above 5.7% is classed as prediabetes. Whereas in Canada or, 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 or the UK, where I trained, 6 to 6.5% is classed as prediabetes. So that is a concern, the differing uh, uh, definitions. I prefer the less than 6.5% off all diabetes uh, medications for at least three months. Thank you. Wang Yu? Yeah, so um, I was just want to add more comments. So in addition to those uh, A1C centric measurements, I was wondering if we will be beneficial to actually add a larger, like, uh, for example, not only the length of the time where we look at the remission window, but also add a more like a cardiovascular related panel, for example, some of the lipid in the blood, trying to really fully show that the resolution of the disease is really not only on the A1C or a glycemic control, but also other some influencing metabolic health. Mike? <clears throat> Yeah, ours is a research study, so I guess, um, and we're mostly looking at helping people. I, I would say remission is dependent on whatever parameters you're <laughs> you're working with. I think you're raising a good point, though, Anne. I think it should, as people define it or put it in there, they should always quantify exactly or specify exactly what they're doing. Like it's remission for this, you know, this analyte for at you know this time frame. So I, I think we should get more specific in the literature. Uh, and in our talks with this sort of thing. So I think your point's valid. Gillian, do you have anything you'd like to add? Or Yeah, I would just say that um, it's really complex to look at that using administrative data. So for example, we have to show that someone's consistently has a normal blood sugar on their laboratory testing. Of course, we know that not everyone's getting laboratory testing. Some people are avoiding doctors, they're going to lab. Um, so we have to account for all of those things in our interpretation. Um, and then we tell that somebody doesn't have diabetes by the fact that they're not in a diabetes registry or an administrative data set that's been validated. So we kind of accept that there is some misclassification in our data and we have to be really quite careful of how we interpret things. So I think from our perspective, you know, looking at that transition between disease states, we have to be a bit careful. But, and we can look at whole populations as opposed to what is, you know, one person might be misclassified. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, so thank you all for uh, excellent uh, talks sort of with wide ranging utilization of big data. So that was lovely. Um, so let's go around again. Actually, this is not going around, but this is coming back to our first speaker, John Dennis. And there were some questions regarding development of composite risk scores and whether that was developed and how that would compare to your um, analysis. And another related question to that also to you, John, was um, utilization of where do you see the cardiovascular risk, knowing that we have these uh, beautiful uh, clinical trials data that are, you know, uh, very robust. Um, how do you sort of uh, fit that into your predictive models? Sure. Um, so, so starting with the um, the, the later point, I think that's that's a really key challenge. So, so the work I presented has been focused on HbA1c and um, other shorter term outcomes. So, there is obviously scope to extend that and extend that research framework to look at harder cardiovascular and renal endpoints as well. Um, the limitation is a lack of head-to-head -head cardiovascular outcome trials to, to evaluate the relative drug efficacy for those outcomes. So we know most of the large cardiovascular, well, I think all of them pretty much are, are placebo or usual care controlled. And, and what you really need to evaluate, you know, two drugs head-to-head -head is, is that a systematic follow-up in controlled conditions. So you may end up being reliant solely on observational data, which is, um, as, 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 others, as others have pointed out in the chat, is um, potentially subject to, to, to extreme bias. Um, so uh, that's possible, and it'd be an exciting thing to look at. I mean, thinking about integration of precision medicines approaches in clinical care, it's whether we, we even need that. So. A simpler solution is to develop models where we can for um, things like glycemia, side effects, where we can validate in trials. And then when we build the actual decision aids to augment those models with information that's in current clinical guidelines. So, for example, we can use routine data to accurately identify the subgroups of patients who are likely to have a particular benefit. Um, on SGLT2s and GLP1s and provide that information in the actual decision tool itself to, um, alongside the HBO1C. So that, that's the way we can do it without you know, any further research. That's a software engineering task. Precision medicine wise, yeah, I think um, it's an open question about how we get there for those endpoints. Uh, as regards the first question, which I think was around um, the composite the risk model that, that we uh, used for SGLT2s and, and DPP4s. So, um, yeah, this, this was based on, on just five um, simple covariates. Um, and as discussed, it essentially is a model to predict HB1C outcome, um, but we use it by implementing interact if it's a classical statistical model, implementing interaction terms between drug and each clinical feature. Um, and those interaction terms represent differential treatment effects. So there, what we're really interested in is how reliable those differential factors are. Um, and that's what we test out in the trials. Uh, for, for HB1C, the performance of the risk model to actually predict HB1C outcome accurately is, is modest. Um, and that really is because, as we know, HbA1c is subject to at an individual level to, you know, mar marked biological variation, and you know will be affected by diet lifestyle changes, you know, probably to at least or even larger a degree than it will be at the actual drug initiated. So, so we don't think we can actually predict where your HbA1c will be six or twelve months down the line accurately. But what we can do is use your underlying biology, clinical features to identify which drug will, will likely be optimal for you. So it's that treatment difference we're trying to predict, which is, is a, a new thing in terms of precision medicine. Thank you. 
So um, I, this is a question, John, I think that you could um, pick up, but actually I'd like to ask it more broadly because I think um, it has uh, ramifications for, for each of you in terms of your opinion. And it's one that's been uh, put in the question and answer by Safir Rahman Khan. And it's a, a general question, which is, should we integrate type 2 diabetes related omic clusters with pancreatic beta cell function and insulin resistance to better define type 2 diabetes heterogeneity? I'm interpreting that as um, clusters perhaps related to the beautiful work from Miriam Adler, Jose Flores, Anuba Mahajan, Mark McCarthy and others around partition risk scores. John, sorry, I was going to start with you again. I know you've been okay. you've been busy, but I want to hear the no, 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 sure. in the background, which I just heard, which was making me feel very homesick. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. So I think that that's the next step as far as far as we're concerned. So we set out to do to see if we can implement a precision medicine approach that can be eventually used low cost. And the advantage of using routine features is that um, by nature, you know, we can Im implement that that um, in, in many countries, you know, as augmenting usual care. Um, but the, the next question is, where does omics, particularly, yeah, Miriam Oliver's really exciting work around um, uh, clusters, whether that can help um, and add over the routine clinical features to identify differential patient outcomes. So that's something we, we'd really like to take forward in the future. Thank you, John. Uh, and Sat Satya, before I um, ask you, there's a couple of questions uh, that I think are particularly uh, pertinent and relevant to you in the the, uh, the chat. But have have you thought about how uh, genetic risk scores could be useful in um, looking at response to bariatric uh, surgery, or do you think the the effects are so good that, we, that it, there's just no room for, uh, for for genomics in any prediction there? No, I think genetics uh, are important. The response to bariatric surgery is heritable, and I think genetics are very important. Now, and I think it will be very important to understand the etiology uh, of the condition. Now, the question, as is the case with most of genetics, can that be translated into everyday clinical care? If it is something that can be easily measured, and if we can explain a large proportion of the variance in, in whatever we're measuring, then, then yes. But in the short term, I suspect that routine everyday clinical parameters will be more informative, but I can envision a day one day when genetic factors will be incorporated into uh, a sort of global sort of clinical prediction tool, providing it, it can be done uh, uh, easily. Thank you. Uh, there was a question uh, in the Q&A around the different uh, varieties and types of uh, bariatric surgery and the fact that they have different outcomes. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on uh, your answer there to, uh, in the chat just to, to, to inform the wider audience about those differences and, uh, and what we know about that. Yes, yeah, so in general, the procedure that causes the greatest weight loss typically causes uh, uh, the greatest remission in general. And the biliopancreatic diversion uh, is probably the most effective uh, treatment for type 2 diabetes remission. However, it's a big procedure and causes lots of uh, adverse effects. And so it's not a particularly uh, commonly performed procedure anymore. So the two most commonly performed ones now are the rheumoid gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. Now, for years, observational data had suggested that the rheumoid gastric bypass was, was superior. But we never had RCT data. And recently, a Scandinavian group looked at one-year outcomes, and rheum y gastric bypass was definitely better than sleep gastrectomy in that cohort. But the question, of course, is what happens longer term? Because some of these patients will have weight regain. So that remains an open question. The gastric lap band used to be performed very commonly 10 or 15 years ago, but it's generally not a very effective procedure, and it's commonly not done anymore. So I suspect number one is biliopancreatic diversion, followed by Ruan Y, followed by sleeve. Super, thank you. Um, Mina? Yeah, so um, thank you. So I have a provocative question here, probably for Mike and Wen Yu. Um, this is from Lawrence Phillips, and he's asking, um, whether, you know, using for diabetes diagnosis within the first uh, one to three years, using the multi-omics approach minus the glucose versus 
taking the second highest glucose levels at least twice during the year, what would be the, the ROC uh, predicted value? Um, is there data or do you have uh, opinions and others may also chime in afterwards after uh, we hear from, let's start with when you. Um, and that's pretty interesting question. Um, I guess so one of the rationale is that um, to consider multiple like a second highest glucose and has, having more presentative view. Um, yeah, I think uh, we, we haven't looked at that, but we definitely can pursue with our data. I mean, I guess this brings back sort of what was just shared with us and, and our knowledge clinically about not, especially these newer agents where they are effective for, let's say, diabetic complications, where they are sort of not in, in non-diabetic cohorts, right? So um, anyway, uh, what about Mike? Any comments? I made a rookie mistake of leaving my mute on there. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to step back a second and, and get into this whole predictive stuff. So I'm a believer, that, uh, like all of you, that, you know, this is a very heterogeneous disease and subtyping is going to be very informative. Uh, where are we with polygenic risk scores? Well, I think in general, they work for the very top end of the distribution. <laughs> if you're really at the high end, and I'm an example of that, I'm way at the extreme end. I was predicted to be at high risk for type 2 diabetes, which in fact I did get. We think the virus plus the genetics triggered it. And, um, and I think that's true for cardiovascular disease. You can show, again, from the top couple percent, it works pretty well. I think as you go down, further, then you need to add in other factors to get more predictive. And again, the clinical measurements take on more and more value as your as your risk score gets lower because the predictive value of these is, you know, is not super high. So I ultimately think that subtyping it the way Anna was talking about, you know, where you can subtype both the risk, the genetic risk into its types, along with the various markers, because we find different markers are predictive of, for example, insulin resistance via SSPG versus OGTT, they're not the same predictive markers for each of these things. And I think that's reflecting where the glucose dysregulation is coming from. So I think the right way to think about this whole area, this is why this is a discussion I assume, why I'm throwing this out there, is really to stratify the disease and, and go on each parameter and set up predictive markers on those and lump them all together because you lose your power. So I think that's the right way to approach all of this. And, and I think this is where big data should solve it. If we get enough data of the same types on people, we need the genome sequences or the genotypes. Uh, I'm a believer whole genome sequences because of the strong, we're totally leaving out all the, all the high risk, the Modi predictive stuff uh, from the genetic side. Um, <clears throat> we treat them separately, which is not the right way to go, do it either. So the bottom line is I think we need, you know, the genomes, we need all these omics profiles to be able then to find the right markers for each of the subtypes. And then I think we're going to get much, much better predictive value. So we're kind of doing a little bit now, but not at the level we could be. Thank you. Any other thoughts from other speakers here on this topic of the utility of glucose versus other omics data? Okay, then I'll move on with another question. Um, this is directed to uh, Jillian. Um, so, so this uh, temperature in uh, GDM is, is quite fascinating. And are there any data or research on, uh, on uh, um, thermogenicity? Um, what are the thoughts there? Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually just looking at that last question that I guess Mike asked about, um, you know, how much are seasonal effects affected by, you know, season versus um, thermogenesis and so on, or how much is activity? And it's a bit complicated because, for example, there may be different risks or different exposures actually acting at the same time, for example. Um, and the way that we, you know, we see actually opposite effects. So we'd expect that if it's improved insulin sensitivity when it's cold, you'd expect that sugar should be better. For example, people with diabetes should have a lower vitamin C or people at risk of getting a disease, getting gestational diabetes, for example, should have lower risk. 
Um, but then we also, we see actually that that's the time in say Canada where we see people are more sedentary. So you see these kind of opposite effects. Um, and so people come to the clinic after spring, usually once where there's been a few months of kind of this sedentary activity and the vacancies are higher. So what we do with um, large data sets is we actually try and stratify to see what, try and sort of separate out what happens in this season versus what's happening in that season and to look for interactions. So for example, we looked at gestational diabetes risk and walkability. And so walkability was protective in all three seasons. So people who go to the, you know, walk to the local bus stop or whatever, if they do it in the winter, then they're, they're still gonna be protected. Um, but I think these effects are pretty complicated to actually tease out. Um, for example, we found that people living in a highly walkable area, they seem to have more of an adverse effect of air pollution. So it could be because they're outside, they're exposed to air pollution. They're also maybe walking, doing more activity, maybe they have greater bioavailability of pollution into the system in terms of diabetes or hypertension risk. So it's, I think that we're just starting to scratch the surface. And I think it's a great question, but I, I think that we need more data and sort of, it, I think big data can actually help to try and disentangle these effects. There's also a question from uh, Dr. Dash to Mike Snyder regarding uh, whether um, gastric emptying was looked at in terms of the glucose variability data for CGM. Uh, not in that study, but it's something we're looking at now. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So. There's a few other questions for Mike, which I think have been answered, but I, I would like us to, to revisit them because I think they're quite illustrative of some of the uh, points that we want to bring out in this uh, discussion. And Mike, these, these are all about you because you've used yourself as the case study within your uh, study. Uh, and people are fascinated by your, your phenotype um, and uh, your, uh, your uh, glucose trajectory. Um, Siri um, Greeley made some interesting comments, uh, which I, again, I think you've answered them, but I want to pick up on them, which are to do with whether you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. He um, rightly points out that your phenotype is um, a very like a type 1 in terms of uh, being lean, having a beta cell defect. And he also points out that the virus uh, uh, response that you uh, mentioned is also something that has been well reported in type 1 diabetes. So you said you've been sequenced. You said you've got uh, a high type 2 diabetes risk score. What's your type 1 diabetes risk score? Um well, believe it or not, I didn't look at type. Well, I must have looked at type one somewhere along the way. Uh, anyway, I'm not type one diabetic. Uh, I, I, as I say, I can stimulate insulin production I, by antibody measurements. I'm fine. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, we we looked at that as you might imagine right away. And the reality is, again, I can make insulin just fine. Uh, I just don't release it. So I think uh, in my case, it's more likely the virus is, is you know, somehow caused changes uh, in pancreatic function. And I think that scenario we should be looking at my, myself. And I, I just love the idea that, um, again, DNA methylation changes, epigenetic changes seem quite reasonable when you're thinking about viral effects and things like that, as, especially with chronic viruses. I can tell you, you know, as part of always reporting on myself. I get tons of free advice. But I get lots of anecdotal stories too uh, about other people who've had, you know, like mo mono or what have you and getting type two after that. So um, <clears throat> I, I do think it's out there quite a bit. Thank you. So um, this is a timely question and, uh, you know, anybody in the panel could pick this one up. Um, there is quite a bit of this in the literature and they're wondering about, uh, you know, obesity, diabetes that's related to COVID and maybe related to Jillian's uh, data on environment and lockdown. Um, what are the thoughts there in terms of going forward, the incidence of diabetes and obesity? Jillian, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, do you want me to? I just wrote a grant on that. <laughs> um, looking at the effect of lockdowns on diabetes risk. I mean, I think that we're going to see an increase in diabetes in the population with, I mean, we're on like, I don't know, we feel like we're on over 400 days of lockdown in Toronto. Um, for sure, activity rates have gone down in the population, but I think that is not going to be distributed equally. I think there's lots of people who are very resilient 
and have found ways of exercising with gym closures and are eating healthy and become home chefs. And then there's people who are struggling, right, in terms of um, activity, living in a high burden neighborhood. We see the neighborhoods that have the high rates of COVID have high rates of diabetes and other chronic disease and there are areas where people can't get out for a walk or afraid to because they don't want to pass people in the elevator. Um, and then of course, high rates of food insecurity. So I think that we are going to see an increase. And initially it may be related to lockdowns. And I think over the next few years, it will also depend on the economic recovery of different countries and the policies they've chosen and how much support there are for um, lower income people and people who are going to be struggling the most. That's my prediction. Well, maybe to add to this, uh, so that's from the activity side. I'm sure that's true. In fact, the the smartwatch tracking studies, all groups are looking at this, both Apple, Fitbit and others have shown, again, people are less active just to add on to what Jillian was saying. But I think uh, there's now studies and you may have seen them. There's several studies published where after people get COVID, you know, with a couple percent increase over, you know, those who don't are getting type two diabetes. So there clearly is a, a, a trigger as well as other diseases as well. Chronic fatigue seems to be number one uh, coming out of this. So the long haulers may have some chronic conditions and diabetes is certainly going to be one of those. So uh, following on from uh, this a little bit um, uh, and directing this to Dr. Zhao and to Dr. Snyder, um, what are your thoughts on health disparities and um, uh, the use of uh, these integrative uh, wearables and platforms that may not have the same uh, access across all populations? Um, uh, is that something that industry, um, Mike and Wayne, are you thinking about and how will we break down some of those barriers so that this isn't another health disparity issue? When you, why don't you go first? Yeah, so um, that definitely is a challenge in terms of the industry research. And especially right now, we are getting all the data from clinical trial, where the clinical trial uh, is very notorious and lacking diversity over there. So I guess uh, you know, one potential um, like uh, effort we can make is definitely uh, um, like uh, getting more education or getting more message into those uh, like uh, uh, like a race, different races and trying to get them awareness of those uh, different approaches and get them more in participant engagement into those uh, clinic trial or the getting basically having them seeking health care. Um, so that's one potential uh, approach we are taking. Yeah, so my thoughts on this are the, the multiomics itself is very expensive. And quite frankly, we'll only go for the rich. That's because we have a broken healthcare system. Uh, we don't do preventative health, if you will, or preventative medicine. We do, you know, sick care. So if we would invest in keeping people healthy, we would actually make more measurements and measure people while they're more healthy. So the multiomic stuff is expensive. It gets privatized. We've spun off a company. You've seen others out there. Um, and only the rich people can afford it. But I think the wearables is a different story. I think we can put a smartwatch on everyone on the planet. 60% of the planet have a, have a smartphone, okay? If you pair that with a cheapo smartwatch, you've got a health device on 4 billion people. And I think that would be really powerful. Probably Bezos could pay out of pocket and still have billions left over. So I really think we should be thinking about, you know, you don't drive your car around without a dashboard. Why do we run around ourselves without a health dashboard? We could easily do that with some of these devices. I think we'll get there with CGM. They're a little bit pricey now, but the price will drop. They're over the counter in Europe. They're very easy to get. In the U.S., they're hard to get. Uh, you have to have a physician prescribe them. They only usually do it for diabetics. I think Lots of people should have them as pre-diabetics. If you've ever worn a CGM, they're really eye-opening. They show you what spikes you. You instantly start getting away from those food and going into the food you like that don't spike you. We can put these everywhere. We can put them on the poor people, and we could have incredibly powerful effects. So I'm a believer the wearables could be the opposite of the modium. Like they could get to everyone and have huge impact. And I'd like to just emphasize that this probably has come up already. I missed some talks, but I think the diabetes endemic is worse than COVID. I really think we should be taking this head on now, the obesity and diabetes, and not wait till 2050 when everybody's already diabetic. So that's my two cents. And the wearables, I think, will be powerful for that. 
Thank you. That was actually an answer to one of the uh, participants, one of the questions from uh, Brad Richer, who asked whether, you know, you could combine biological treatments with uh, wearables. So thank you for that. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're pretty much on time. Thank you to all of our uh, speakers for fantastic uh, talks showcasing the diverse work going on in this area. Thank you to uh, all the attendees for the uh, questions and the panelists for discussion. I really enjoyed being part of this session. Um, and I'm going to hand back over to uh, Dr. Seflu to uh, do the housekeeping rules. Excellent. So once again, great talk. I uh, appreciate all the speakers uh, and the questions. And again, you can judge the interest by the number of questions. And we certainly had some uh, very interesting questions come forth. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take about a 20 minute break and we will start promptly at 1225. And the last session will be precision medicine and diabetes. We'll have two talks and then we'll go into an extensive panel discussion. The discussion at that point is to really wrap up the entire session. So we'll be taking questions from the other four sessions and see if we can come up with a direction moving forward. So uh, let's take about 20 minutes and we'll start promptly again at 1225. Thanks again. Welcome back uh, to everyone from our break. Uh, we're now ready to proceed with uh, our last session uh, on precision medicine, where we're focusing on the right info for the right people at the right time towards prevention and treatment. And uh, at the first uh, part of our session, we have two esteemed speakers um, to start us off with thought provoking material. And uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Atul Boot. Uh, and uh, he will be speaking on translating a trillion points of data into therapies, diagnostics, and new insights into disease. And as Dr. Boot prepares to show his presentation, I would just remind you to please use the question and answer uh, app for your questions, uh, which will be uh, watching for as the uh, session proceeds, and you can put your comments in Twitter. So, Dr. Boot, over to you. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I just want to make sure, yep, you can hear me. I think you can see my slides here. Perfect. Great. Yep. Thanks for having me, and uh, supreme apologies to the organizers. I sent my slides finally at midnight last night, uh, so uh, you, there is a copy there somewhere. Uh, but I'll, I'll go for about 30 minutes and then obviously as a panel uh, we're taking questions after after uh, Jose's talk. Um, I have a bazillion conflicts of interest. I start a whole bunch of companies. I consult for a whole bunch. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't believe another word I said over the next 30 minutes, um, but I'll move on anyway. All right, so let me just re reintroduce where I am. I'm at the University of California, specifically at UCSF. But uh, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm gonna talk about what we've been doing for the past five years, now six years, uh, at, across the entire University of California. So just to introduce, University of California is enormous. We have 10 campuses, three national labs, including one, the Lawrence Livermore, which I think has the number one supercomputer in the country, 200,000 employees, uh, and that'll come up in a moment. Uh, we're one of the larger employers in the United States, and then a quarter million students per year. And of course, we're still like most US universities and companies trying to figure out what to do with all these employees and students. We have 20 health professional schools, six of which are medical schools, but we also have, also have pharmacy, dental, veterinary, uh, nursing, public health schools. We train half the medical students and residents in California, uh, 2 billion in NIH funding, and then we make about 13 billion seeing patients. 5,000 doctors get a paycheck from us every month, but 100,000 doctors write orders on our patients. Uh, that's all the residents and fellows. And then we're not just uh, shabby organizations, at least UCSF and UCLA are in the US News Top 10. We only mention that when we're in the top 10, otherwise we care so little for that metric. We have five independent comprehensive cancer centers, five CTSAs, and then we got these superpowers that we are that are so secret we forget them as well. IRB reliance, which means if, if any of our medical schools approves an IRB, the other five automatically approve it, and then centralized contracting, which means uh, we can sign off on a contract at the office of the president, and then all ten campuses agree, no renegotiation needed, so we can scale pretty quickly. And about three years ago, now coming up on four years ago, we all decided to create. Um, this entity called University of California Health or UC Health. 
and it's an umbrella across the health professional schools and the health delivery organizations here. And we did that because we're trying to build what's, what's called an accountable care organization or an ACO. This comes out of the whole uh, Obamacare nomenclature. Uh, an accountable care organization means we would take on risk for paid a certain amount of money, a fixed amount of money per member per month. And then anything that happens to that patient is our problem, it's our risk. And so uh, we decided that aspirationally, you could see in the text there, within 10 years, okay, so long-term aspiration, we will build a single accountable care organization for the entire University of California across these six academic health centers. Now, long way to go, but the first thing that we decided, that first question that came up is, uh, well, whose style of medicine are we gonna use, right? So maybe UCSF treats diabetes this way and UCLA treats it that way. Uh, so which is the right way to do it? And right away you see, and you come up with the need to actually compare uh, care uh, across all the ways we can deliver care. Uh, so comparative effectiveness, but for our reasons, right? Not because we're getting a grant to do comparative effectiveness. We legitimately want to know what is the best way to treat our patients to build this ACO. And so that led to the creation of a central data warehouse with all clinical data from all six academic health centers. Now you see the logos at the bottom. And just to point out first, UCR, so that's Riverside, they're tiny, okay? They're a brand new medical school they have some outpatient clinics. They don't have a hospital system there yet that, that we own or run, but the other five are massive, okay? So San Diego, you see Irvine, LA, San Francisco, and Davis each have millions of patients as you'll see in a moment. And uh, we had been happy uh, getting all clinical data from each of these sites uh, every single month. So they keep a copy, of course, and then we have a centralized, so it's central, not federated, centralized copy of everything. Uh, until COVID, and then we switch to a daily copy of all COVID-related data. Everything else comes in about every two weeks, and we're slowly moving up to every week uh, to get all this data. All right, and why I'm highlighting data is if you really want to teach AI what to do with diabetes, you got to see a lot of clinical data. And I'm going to argue uh, that nowhere else in the United States do we have six academic health centers bulk data sharing like this, okay, every single month. Okay, not federated, centralized copy of everything here. All right, so what does this look like? This is, so we love to start with our top line number of 15 million patients. Yes, indeed. The University of California has treated 15 million patients the last 15 years. Now it's a nice round number because that's 5% of the entire United States population has been treated by the University of California, but that's a little too far back, okay? If you count when we put in our, you know, quote, modern electronic health record system, which is epic, uh, and yes, I hesitate to use modern and Epic in the same sentence, but I'll do that nonetheless. But when we installed Epic, which was January of 2012 forward, we've now seen 7 million patients, okay, which what I'll call modern data. Now I'm only counting the main hospitals and the main clinics on the main campuses. So for example, UCSF has been affiliated with San Francisco General for more than a hundred years, our county hospital, our safety net hospital, I'm not even counting those patients yet nor any of the 15 other hospitals we partner with in the North, uh, Northern California area. I'm only counting our own hospitals and clinics, our main ones. And even that gets us to 7 million patients. And you can see 2012 is about nine years ago. So we're coming up on now nine years longitudinal data, uh, high resolution longitudinal data, because when we're talking about Epic, we're talking about every drug, every dose, every vital sign, every respiratory rate on every single patient. You can see some of the numbers here. So 220 million encounters, uh, for example, we have a million and a half telehealth encounters just over the past year, of course, like many others, uh, half a billion procedures. We're nearing uh, 800 million uh, medications, and that's going to come up in a moment. Uh, 722 million diagnosis codes, just to pick something else. And then 2.1 billion blood test results and vital signs. Uh, now, we're not just um, uh, primary care, okay? We have tertiary quaternary care. And so the way I like to describe this is we have everything from Tylenol to CAR T cells, right? Tylenol is probably the cheapest thing we do for patients, right? Give them a tablet of Tylenol. Uh, CAR T cells, when you take out uh, uh, blood cells and train them to fight cancer, put them back, is probably the most expensive thing we do to patients. And even there, we have hundreds of patients very few with CAR T cells. So it's everything in between there. We have state regulatory data from OSHPA, that's a California regulatory data, pathology, radiology, text now. And we conveniently also run the death index for the entire state of California. So anyone who dies in the state of California, whether they're our patient or not, we, we know that for social security and other reasons. We have claims data from our self-funded plan. I'll explain what a self-funded plan is in a moment and why it's relevant to diabetes AI. And then we're constantly harmonizing all this. Because as you know, we have new drugs that we can use 
probably every week from the pharma and biotech industry. So we're constantly making sure all the RX norm codes. And if there is no RX norm code, we'll invent our own until we get one. And that happens on a weekly to monthly basis. Everything's harmonized constantly. I'll just give you a rough idea what all this means. I did this last night. Here are 3.1 million hemoglobin A1C measurements, okay, across the entire University of California Health System. Uh, and this is GG plot in R. So literally, we have raw database access to every lab test uh, for the 7 million patients. Uh, the top line there on the y axis is 1.25. So you can see nearly, nearly 1.25 million patients uh, have a hemoglobin A1C around six, okay, but you can see some have down to 15. It's kind of an interesting distribution. I had not seen this distribution until I made this for the talk here. Uh, but pick any blood test, we have all of them, right, for all of these patients here in a centralized database. And by the way, it's all de identified, uh, as we'll talk about at the end. Uh, and it's actually so blessed by the IRBs that it's what we consider non human subjects research. So no our IRB approval needed to generate plots like this or to do this kind of analysis for University of California faculty, staff, students, and trainees here. All right, now first, let me just make a point because I always want to make a point because I think there are also some patients and representatives here. We give all of this data back to patients, right? I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about what we do with this data. But I want to make sure we give all of this data to the patients as well. So what that means is we export it in a federal standard called FHIR, F-H-I-R. It's a nice new standard for exporting data. And we'll talk about that if we, if we get, get to that in the panel. Uh, but if you go to the, for example, the Apple Health app, you go to health data and do the health records, you tap in UC, you're going to see all of our sites on there. I think we were the launch partner with Apple. So all of the, that data, those data elements go to patients. So I want to make sure if you're a patient with us, you get an integrated record across the entire University of California in the Apple Health app, or we're, we're actually helping uh, Google and Android make one for Android as well. All right, so that's the patient side of it. Now, what do we do with all this data? Uh, this is basically where it lives. And by the way, let me just make a, uh, two points here. I forgot to mention here. By the way, this is a, a identifiable data, okay? So this is a centralized database, 7 million patients, identifiable data. We use this for quality improvement and operations. Uh, and you're gonna see, we're gonna use the addresses for latitude longitudinal in, in a moment. It's identifiable data here. And so this is where they all live. Uh, so here on the left, there's every zip code. Uh, there's a bar chart, how many of those patients, the size of the bar, the, the pie chart rather, uh, means how many patients are in that zip code. And there's several colors because some patients in that zip code go to one campus or the other. You can see Las Vegas has colors there because of course, if you're sick anywhere in this region of the country, you might be coming to the University of California for care. The Hawaiian islands are covered with our colors, for example. And in Northern California, you can see UCLA, uh, UCSF and UC Davis. In Southern California, you see LA, you see uh, uh, Irvine and San Diego. And then Riverside is a tiny little dot, which you can't see, it's about a thousand patients. Of course, we have uh, uh, the campuses, the bar at the top there, you can see age, race, gender, ethnicity, uh, and I'll get to uh, locations and things like that in a moment here. Now, let me put it, let me start with this, is that this entire database is paid for out of operational dollars, okay? We've made and saved enough money for the health systems that we don't need an NIH grant for this, okay? We are, the CTSAs do not give us a single dollar to run this research database, but the beauty here is we have the same database for clinical operations and for research, okay? So we don't have to duplicate or triplicate work. Once the thing is built in an identifiable database, then it is actually nearing triviality to make a de-identified copy for research. But the main system was built out of health system dollars, okay? And these are the four big reasons why they pay us to build and maintain this database. We improve the quality of care. We decrease expenses and self-fund plans. I'm going to show you that one in a minute because it's diabetes. Uh, central management of primary care patients, I'm going to show that as well here. But we save enough money with the health system, with this database, that essentially research use is marginal to free, okay? We don't need a CTSA, a dollar from the CTSAs to actually keep this up and running here. Here's one example, right? Remember I mentioned uh, you know, we have 15 million patients, but I also mentioned that we have 200,000 employees. And we're really lucky that many of our employees and their family members want to get care with us, right? So if you think through all the incentive errors for a second, right, that's an employee that works for us, but also gets their health care with us. And if you think, if you think about it, any health care that we deliver to our employees or their dependents is actually technically a cost center, not a revenue center for us. And all of a sudden, magically, all the alignment arrows work in that small test bed cohort, okay? So we can kind of test bed our analytics and uh, making more medicine more efficient on our own employees because we care for them. We care for a lot of people, 
but we also care for our own. And it's not the case in every US academic medical center that the employees want to get care there, but it is for us. And so it's in our own interest to make sure our care that we deliver to our own employees is the most efficient, safe, uh, responsible care we can deliver. One thing we noticed, for example, in our employees is that many of them were getting prescribed brand name forms of metformin instead of generic forms of metformin which has been available in generic form for decades. Now I know there's osmotic forms and extended release forms and all of those coming on generic at different times, but we noticed that our employees were getting prescribed brand name uh, instead of generic. But wonder of wonders, it's our own doctors writing the prescriptions to our own employees, right? So, you know, we're really actually, that's the equivalent of burning money on the front lawn of a hospital, okay? Uh, so we made a lot of changes. We made a master list of every doc that's doing this, every patient, every employee that's getting uh, the meds. And you can call, phone call all of these folks and try to change things. And, you know, people love the color of their pills so not everyone wants to switch back to generic. But for heaven's sake, let's not start new patients, new employees on this. So we made it harder and epic to order brand name metformin. And boom, you see a chart at the top here. Already we've saved millions of dollars for the University of California Health System just on one drug. Now we scale this to cardiac drugs, hypertensive, depression, major depression. Just this pays for the entire database, okay? Just this saves all enough money to get all of the staff and money and, and database working here, okay? Everything else is icing on the cake here. Now, of course, we're using this to manage patients and we have now uh, teams across all the UC health systems. We're trying to come up with the University of California way to treat diabetes, the UC way. And to do that, we're treating, we're really taking diabetes care seriously. We've made a centralized dashboard here. You can see of the 41, almost 42,000 patients that are being actively managed with type 2 diabetes. Now, this is an old slide. I, I, I haven't copy pasted the latest one. This is back in September, I think it is. Uh, and so what, what do you see here? Uh, you can see 41,000 patients here. It's a, a couple months old, but we, we do this uh, on a monthly basis. And all of the population health quarterbacks on each uh, campus gets this as well as the diabetes specialist working with them and the primary care diabetes uh, uh, aficionado working with them. So diabetes teams across all the campuses. And we can see, okay, well, uh, the majority of our actively managed type two diabetes patients are followed by PCP, but we also have the endocrinologist. So specialty care, we see the latest hemoglobin A1C in the middle there. And you know, of course, during COVID, not as many people going out, uh, a lot of A1Cs were increased. And uh, at the bottom there, you can see uh, metrics. So A1C control, blood pressure, eye, kidney health, uh, all the rest of the usual quality metrics, and then the 50% IHA benchmarks here. We have a single dashboard tracking all managed type 2 diabetes patients across all of our health systems, okay? Now, I would pause. I'm going to challenge you to find anywhere else in the United States where this happens. And this is just actively managing population health for type 2 diabetes. Of course, we know what drugs they're on. That's gonna come up in a moment here. But this is what we do now for diabetes. We're moving to hypertension, lipids, and all the rest. And using this, you know, a bag borrowing and stealing best practices from one campus to the other to actively manage. Now, zip code over genetic code. I know the last day and a half is all a bit about mo molecules. I love molecules, I love genomics too. But I'm more increasingly convinced that there is something to be said about studying the social determinants of health. And I wanna put in a plug for those. And so we, uh, we have many metrics of that. And this is just the first pass way to get the social determinants of health is to look at where people live. Now, what we can do now and what we've done for our entire UC-wide primary care population, in fact, all 7 million patients, we know where they live. You can map that to what's called a nine digit zip code and even a census track, and then map that to what's called the area deprivation index. Now it's one of many social determinants of health. This one comes out of, I think it's University of Wisconsin. And it's a, it's a single number that estimates income levels in that census tract, the education, employment, housing, grocery deserts, things like that. Um, and it's, uh, again, pretty narrow there. And we've geocoded all of that. And then we can study that against, for example, hemoglobin A1C and all the rest here. Now on the right there, you can see what it looks like for California. Blue would be the most advantageous, advantageous neighborhoods. Red would be the least advantageous neighborhoods. For example, rural neighborhoods are least advantageous typically here. But there is also, if you look in our immediate neighborhoods, these are what our six main health system campuses look like. Of course, the San Francisco Bay Area, even relative to California, is obviously wealthy, but there's pockets, uh, you know, major pockets of red there 
you can see LA and Orange County are more mixed, San Diego, Riverside, Sacramento, much more rural uh, areas there as well. So we have patients from all of these here. This is what it looks like for type two diabetes. Now we can't map all 40,000 PO boxes. If you get your mail in a PO box, it makes it very hard to map to a exact geo-coded latitude longitude for your house. We have tricks to figure out PO boxes, but this is what it looks like for about 33,000 mappable ones. Homeless ones get placed into 10. Of course we have homeless patients. You, they don't have an address. It's amazing how people code homelessness in a system. They typically give them the hospital's address. So well, there's all sorts of heuristics you got to figure out. And it's a spread. Of course, we see more wealthier folks on the coast, but we definitely see some least, uh, less advantageous folks on the right here. Now we could take a area deprivation index and compare it and run a massive linear regression across the latest hemoglobin A1C. That's what this is. So, and what we know is people who live in a worse or more challenging area deprivation index area have a higher A1C independent of age, sex, race, and ethnicity, okay? So at the bottom there, you see least at, uh, most advantageous on the left, least advantageous on the right. You can see there at the average, uh, you see these uh, violin plots there uh, for the hemoglobin A1Cs, and you can just see how it's crossing there. In fact, the difference from the right to the left is about 0.4 of an A1C, okay? So you might argue, oh, what's the big deal of dropping 0.4? But what that means is if we take on average in our system with real data, if we take that individual individual who lives on in an area of 10 and somehow they move to an area of one, we would expect, okay, and the logistic, the linear regression would expect their A1C to improve 0 0.4 just by moving, just by moving. Now, what does 0 0.4 mean? If you actually look at clinical trials for diabetes drugs, what they hope to get to in 90 days is 0 0.4. So it's almost like starting a new drug for diabetes, moving someone from area 10 to area one, or the reverse, moving from one to 10. Now, again, this is just one of many ways we should be studying social determinants of health, okay? This is a numeric one. Probably a lot of people like numbers on this call, on the Zoom, but we should do better, and there's a lot here that we're gonna be capturing here. And I'm gonna argue precision medicine, right? We're going to have to treat the patients in area one different than the ones in area 10, right? You have some worse performers, let's say, you see some A1Cs of 10 in area ones and area 10s, but I don't think they're having that worse A1C because of the same reasons, okay? I think we're gonna have to figure out the causality of why that patient is having a high A1C independently. And I'm gonna argue the zip code is just as important, um, maybe you can argue even more important than the genetic code here, okay? This has got to be a must for us to model precision medicine or diabetes care. And of course, AI too. We wrote a lot of it. This, I'm going to go skip through quickly. This is what the FDA now calls real world evidence. We wrote a paper, uh, Vivek and I wrote a paper in JCI about a year ago. I, I'm, not, I'm just going to skip through these. There are 21 big uses for real world data. I'm going to skip that here. Uh, and people, of course, I'll paste the links in the Zoom chat here. All right, I got less than 10 minutes left here. Uh, so let me just step through what, uh, a little bit more on diabetes here. Uh, of course, we got to look at the drugs that we're using to treat diabetes. Now, one way to think about how we treat diabetes uh, are the, uh, the nomograms we use to treat diabetes. Now, this one's a little bit old from the American Diabetes Association, but I love this one, okay? Because it gives you an idea of how we use these professional standards uh, or consensus guidelines to treat diabetes, right? How do you read this, right? So a patient comes in at the top, get them to lose weight or uh, to exercise. If that fails, you move to a big metformin in the middle. And if that fails, you go to these six other categories of drugs you could add. And then if that fails, you add in another category of drugs. And if all of that fails at the bottom, go to metformin and insulin. Now, I know this is a little bit old. I know it's been tweaked uh, a little bit, but I love this one. Look at the pastel colors. It's like made for us in California. Now, if you look at this though, a natural question appears, which one of those six categories in the middle do you use, right? They're all like similar colors and squares you would not exactly guess that some of those drugs cost 200 times more than the other drugs, right? Uh, because they're all kind of the same shape. So which ones do we actually use in the University of California? And so we're looking at this a lot. In fact, the model, the analogy I use in the lay public for this is uh, to think about a pachinko machine. Have you ever seen a pachinko machine? There are these kind of vertical pinball machines in Japan where the ball drops from the top and you're trying to figure out where it drops and what is it hit on the way down. This is like a particular machine because we're trying to figure out where does the patient go from box to box here, right? All right, so let's look at this. So how do we do this? Well, we start by looking at diabetes at UCSF 
Now, these numbers are larger because these are all patients, not just the currently managed 40,000. This goes back nine years. These are all the first drug starts that we can find in electronic health record at UCSF. So you see 26,000 patients. Now, we used to call these diabetes donuts. Of course, donuts are inappropriate for diabetes. So now we call these lifesaver plots. And the way to read this is you got a third of it in yellow, okay? And you can see at the bottom, that means metformin. Great, they're starting on metformin. But about a quarter of them are starting on insulin first. That's kind of interesting for type two, but I guess we could do that. And all the other colors there are all different drugs or combinations of drugs that we're starting patients on. The dark gray at the top, there's so many slices there, we can't even show all the colors. So now what happens? Uh, and by the way, this has been published in this work by Tom Peterson. You see the link at the bottom there, just, just came on diabetes care, I think two or three months ago. Now what happens, right? A patient comes in, we start them on a med, we send them home, we say, come back in 90 days, let's see how you're doing, right? So here's now the next 90 days. Patient comes back, what do we do next for that patient? Well, yellow, okay? So you see a lot of yellow without another bar there. That means they're happy on that dose of metformin. They're, we've never changed it again. Yellow going to yellow means that they're still on metformin, but we had to tweak the dose. Any other color change means we added a drug, subtracted a drug, or changed a drug. Okay, go home. Let's see you back in 90 days. Here is the third thing we did for that patient. Okay, we made a change. Go home, come back in 90 days. Here's the fourth thing we did for that patient. And I'm going to say fourth move, okay? I'm going to use this analogy of playing games. Now, I'm not using games to belittle having diabetes, okay? It's terrible having any condition or diabetes. But I think of us practicing medicine more and more of us playing a game against the disease. Why is that? Because we make a move and then we're waiting for the disease to, and the patient to make a move. And then we make the next move, right? It might be every 90 days in clinic. It might be morning, morning rounds, right? We, we read the orders in the morning. Let's see how they do during the day. We make more orders the next morning, right? It's very kind of synchronous how we practice medicine. And of course I'm saying moves because computers are really great at playing move-based games. Oh, by the way, this is the 26,000 patients at UCSF that we've ever treated. Now we scale with one button. Here are the uh, three quarters of a million medication orders on 160,000 type 2 diabetes patients we've seen over the past nine years. By the way, how many moves are there for the first four moves here? On the, the big circle on the left there, we count more than 5,000 ways our doctors make just the first four moves in this game. Okay, there are 5,000, more than 5,000 different slices in that big pie chart there in the top left there. All of this is in the paper in diabetes care. This is probably unnecessary practice variation. Of course, we can study this. In fact, I think comparative effectiveness of the future isn't just going to compare drugs against each other, it's going to be comparing strategies against each other. Maybe a random doc in Riverside has figured out the most efficient way to get a patient to, to proper A1Cs, right? Maybe there's some natural experimentation going on here. There's clearly practice variation. Can we get this down to 1,000? Can we get this down to maybe 10 ways to do this? That is our stated goal in University of California, that we will get this down, okay, to a handful of ways of the proper way to try to, teach, try to, teach type, uh, to treat type 2 diabetes. Now, again, move-based games, Computers are great at learning this, okay? I just show, for example, playing chess. Of course, they play checkers and go, you know, computers are great at thinking, okay, I'm going to make this move, but I'm going to predict the, the disease is going to make the next move, and I'm going to make another move here, right? So we're really great at predicting the next move here. In fact, here, you just see, uh, again, Tom Peterson, this hasn't been published yet, the predicted A1C in 90 days versus the observed A1C in 90 days. We're really great now at figuring out if we start this med versus that med, what is the A1C going to be in 90 days? We're getting reasonably better at this. That's part of how you play a game of chess is to figure out where the board is going to be. I think we can get there too soon. In fact, you don't even need deep learning and neural networks for some of this. Remember I showed you the yellow, the, the metformin side of it? Um, you know, can we just predict who's going to do great on metformin and who's going to need to switch, right? This, again, this is learned from the data here. Uh, what we've learned is uh, you see the decision tree on the right there. If your hemoglobin A1C was ever more than 8.8, .8, or if your fasting glucose was ever higher than 206, you're in the red squares there. We know the metformin is going to fail for you. 
I know what the American Diabetes Association says for you to do, but we've treated over a hundred thousand patients now in the University of California, and we've seen it just fails. And what we're going to get to a point soon is to be able to say, whatever that next move was you're gonna make, make that move now, and let's get this patient to better therapy that much faster. And I think the future of evidence-based guidelines is gonna move away from expert-based guidelines to data-driven guidelines, right? Because consensus agreements mean experts and experts are gonna ask a certain set of questions and not ask other questions. But the data is gonna speak in a way, I think, just by practice variation. Of course, you gotta do a lot of modeling to figure out, are all these patients the same? Why is this one being started this way, that way, cardiovascular risk? Of course, you gotta do all of that. We got the medical records to do it. I think this is the future of precision medicine in practice. Patient needs a new drug. Let's run this 90 day and 180 day simulation to figure out which patient is gonna benefit from which drug the best and then help with that order set here. We're enabling UC researchers to do all of this machine learning now in a safe, respectful, fair and equitable way. I think those two last uh, words are important. I love being in the University of California because the diversity of the world is in California and is treated by the University of California here. And this is one of many pa oh, papers we've written, even with some commercial partners like Google and others, learning how to do this in a safe, respectful way, predicting the future. We can do this now in rheumatoid arthritis. Bonodra, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these slides here. But I think the future is not to use AI to then revisit what we've been calling a learning healthcare system, right? Learning from our patients and the data. I think the computer is gonna to start to do some of this for us so that we're not dependent on experts to come up with an idea. I wanna improve that, I wanna improve this. I see a future pretty soon where the computer is constantly looking at everything we're doing and it's gonna be able to figure out the outcomes because we got the text notes now. We're gonna be able to get the outcomes better and it's constantly gonna be asking us to improve. You know, computer sees this could be improved and computer sees that could be discontinued. And maybe we're gonna to get to a deep learning healthcare system. I gotta thank an enormous number of collaborators in the last 16 years of my career. Of course, at Stanford and Mike Snyder and good friends still at Stanford, UCSF and NIH. Uh, the incredible team across the University of California that puts all of this data together, um, including a great team at University of California Health. I have to thank UCSF and Professor John Mark Zuckerberg for endowment support, the you know, Baker Foundation for the naming uh, uh, gift for the for the institute. And I have to thank, uh, I, I have to thank, I'm blessed, my lab has been blessed with 20 NIH grants from these 11 institutes of NIH. The ones on left in red give me more money, the ones in orange give me less money, but I still love them. Lots of these foundations. I have to thank my admin and tech staff. I'd never get anything out the door without them. I thank my family and all the friends and mentors who have shepherded me through my career. Thank you very much. And I look forward to taking questions, I think, uh, during the panel. Thank you, Dr. Butte. I really appreciate it. All right, so now we'll move on to a talk on precision medicine and how it's gonna address clinical care. Dr. Flores um, needs no introduction. As you know, he's chief of the Endocrine Division and Diabetes Unit at Mass General and a professor of medicine at Harvard. So Dr. Flores, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Will, for the very kind invitation. Uh, to be in this amazing symposium. What a, but no better way to celebrate the, one, the centenary of insulin uh, coming to treat our patients uh, and really wonderful to have been the company of our Canadian colleagues. Um, I don't have as many disclosures as a tool, but there they are. And for photography, feel free to do what you wanna do as long as you don't use it for commercial use. So I was given a very easy assignment uh, in this talk, which is basically go ahead and predict the future of diabetes. Not, not bad. Uh, I tried to get some more granular with this. We had a meeting uh, in preparation of this meeting. Uh, and then Will reassured me, it's not only predicting the future, but also if you can summarize the conference for us in your half an hour, that would be wonderful. Uh, and then just keep in mind that this is the last uh, conference of the entire session, the last lecture, and it's happening right after lunch. So there's my challenge, trying to predict. And of course, when it comes to prediction, there are many dangers uh, that one can encounter. So for example, there's many things that I think uh, people predicted and have not really come to, to, to bear. So if you remember the Jetsons uh, back in the 60s, this idea that you could get your entire family in a vehicle that would fly around town, that would be great for traffic. That was uh, predicted more than 50 years ago, it hasn't come to be. Something similar where you had no wheels and you could still go very, very fast that came with Star Wars. And again, that hasn't come to be. 
Uh, and then in a personal note, I remember very distinctly uh, dinner I had with some colleagues from the UK in January of 2016, where the topic turned to US politics. And I predicted that there is no way on earth that uh, Donald Trump would, would win the Republican nomination, let alone go on to win the general election. So that was the last time I dared to make any political prediction. So there's things that people predict that really don't come to bear. And then there's things that you don't expect at all and then appear. So who would have thought that in 2007, we would have the entire world at our fingertips? And now anybody on the planet can sit as long as there's a tower nearby where you can transfer data and then have access to all this data right in your palm uh, to the point that is really completely transforming the way we relate to each other. Uh, growing up during the Cold War, I learned the dogma that no country that has fallen to a communist dictatorship uh, ever leaves that state of affairs peacefully. And that's what we learned all throughout. And of course, in 1989, we witnessed how many countries in Eastern Europe, uh, in a peaceful way, uh, were able to, to lead a political system. And again, on a personal note, I just want to introduce you to the man in this picture. His name is Antonio Fernandez. He's 93. He's a podiatrist, still sees patients at age 93. He's my grandfather-in-law. And when he had to leave Cuba with his family, his wife and three teenage children with just one suitcase per person, uh, right after the revolution, little did he know he could never predict that two generations later, his granddaughter, uh, right here, my wife, Lucia Sober, and here shown with our four daughters, would be a full professor at Harvard Medical School in ophthalmology. And so that was not definitely not going through his mind as he got on that plane and left the country that he would never see again. And uh, this just happened two weeks ago. So there's many things that defy prediction. And so when I'm asked to, to ask, what, to, to, to really tell you what we think the future of diabetes is gonna be like, maybe the only, the best thing I can do is to try to hedge my bets. And I'll give you an example of what I mean based on, on something that is as near and dear to all of us. So here's an example of how we can predict diabetes in an individual patient in a paper that my uh, friend and colleague, James Miggs published in the New England Journal back at the dawn of the GWAS era. So at that point, we had already begun to uncover some of the genetic associations with type two diabetes. And the question that we posed in this paper was to see to what extent a genetic predictor was able to do any better than clinical predictors for who is going to get diabetes. We tested this in the Framingham Heart Study. And so what is shown here is the comparison of two models, one simple clinical model, model that had been developed in Framingham that included things like age, sex, family history, um, body mass index, fasting glucose, triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol, and compare that with the ability of a genetic predictor on top of the clinical predictor to do any better. And so when you plot the false positive rate versus the true positive rate and generate your receiver operator characteristic curves where you have the diagonal uh, showing the null distribution of a 50% test of accuracy, you see that the simple clinical model, which includes those variables, gets about 90% area under the curve on the C statistic, meaning that out of 10 patients in front of you, you would guess right for nine out of them in terms of someone developing diabetes within the next eight years. And then the addition of genetics, at the time it was only 18 SNPs, to that predictive tool did not really improve matters at all. Now, in the same issue of the New England Journal, there was a very similar paper from our friends and colleagues in Scandinavia, Leif Group, who had done a very similar exercise. They were back to back, those papers. And this is a very nice quote from, from Leif uh, saying that essentially predicting diabetes by having glucose levels in the model is like predicting rain when you feel water. Because of course, glucose is what determines the diabetes diagnosis. So what I'm gonna do for the greater part of this talk is to basically hedge my bets by predicting what I think is happening based on current successes. Things that we already know are taking place, are unfolding in front of our eyes. They are really reaching meteoric speed. And based on these five areas, uh, I think it is fairly safe to say that the future of diabetes will be greatly informed by the five areas I'm going to mention. The first one is genomics. So of course we've seen a veritable explosion of the ability to query the entire genome in a very rapid and systematic way, first through genotyping, but now increasingly through sequencing. This is the latest iteration of all the genomic loci associated with type 2 diabetes. If you remember, we used to present this linearly in a Manhattan plot. It is now impossible given so many variants. So the last paper out of the Million Veterans Program has done this circle where you have the Manhattan, all the uh, 22 autosomes and the X chromosome in the circle and then all the associations on top. But we have about a 700 or so loci associated with type 2 diabetes, similar kind of progress with type 1 diabetes. 
And together they explain now over 50% of the heritable component of the disease. Now we've heard from Atul and Julia and others how large biobanks, to the extent they can be national biobanks, not only in the UK, but of course also in Japan and China and other places are now beginning to give us a phenotypic information and clinical information uh, for exploration. There's entire healthcare systems that are uh, adopting this and it's really penetrating into clinical care. Genomics is penetrating into clinical care. And then there are companies uh, somewhat labeled entertainment genomics when they first appeared, but now increasingly uh, playing a major role in the scientific scene where companies like 23andMe are using all these data they have collected from the customers, not only to provide information to the customers that they desire, but also to participate in studies where they can increasingly do uh, very accurate and tell, telling uh, genotype phenotype correlations based on the very large numbers that they have amassed. So genomics is one area that will continue to blossom and we will continue to characterize the genetic architecture of these diseases. The other one has already been mentioned is wearables and technology. Uh, here is uh, Michael Snyder, whom we heard earlier this morning um, uh, when he gave his talk about the Snyderome, uh, all, the, all the omics that he has collected. So of course, with these devices, we can uh, be increasingly accurate at collecting uh, vital measures. And here's the, uh, the typical study that, that when you presented this morning um, also on how one can do that in a very scientific uh, way to try to integrate all these wearables. So this is only going to increase and it's only going to expand the number of people are using them. A third area, of course, is biomarkers. So now we have platforms that can assess entire axes of biology, uh, whether it is not just the genome, as I mentioned, but also which genes are on and off of the epigenome, what transcripts are made, the transcriptome, we'll talk about that in a minute but then also the proteins that are made, the metabolites that result from the enzymatic action of those proteins and anything that circulates, and of course, uh, all the species that also live with us. So through all of these, uh, there's no question that these axes of biology will be integrated, analyzed in, in a way that can be more or less comprehended, and that is only something that is going to increase um, as the years go on. I think we will also see a proliferation of this clustering approaches that are used to try to subtype or understand the heterogeneity of disease. So initially it was through the electronic medical record. We heard a very compelling talk this morning from Jillian, but also a tool made that point just now by the UC system, how you can use EHR data to guide a lot of these explorations. Uh, here shown is a very, one of the, the pioneer uh, explorations of this done on Sinai in New York, where they also have a very large biobank. We heard about the Scandinavian group led by Leif Group and Emma Alkvist who have used uh, easy to adopt biomarkers. In this case, it was A1C, uh, C peptide to construct HOMA B and HOMA IR, and a few demographics to be able to construct subtypes of type two, type one and type two diabetes that seem to recapitulate what we see in clinical practice and make some clinical sense. Uh, and increasingly other biomarkers that can be uh, collected through platforms uh, in the metabolomics space, the proteomics space, as I mentioned, uh, will also be incorporated into some of these. Uh, there is other ways to derive these clusters, and the, the two that have already been mentioned, and I'll touch on briefly uh, by Miriam Adler and Anuba Mahajan independently, but really converging on the same uh, solution, uh, uses genomics, but not just genomics by itself, genomics that is informed by the physiological traits that those genetic variants influence. And so when you take a number of metabolic traits and you combine them with the genetic associations for type 2 diabetes, and you let the physiology group or cluster the variants, uh, in ways that are really driven by the physiology, but anchored in the genetics, you can come up with these reproducible clusters. And in the most re recent iteration that Dr. Adler was not able to go over, but uh, is currently in preparation, she has been able to take uh, many more variants than the ones that were used before, many more traits, and in an automated fashion, try to come up uh, with a refinement of these clusters that go beyond the ones originally described and that shed some insight into biology. There's other modalities of data imaging, where there's clinical imaging, you know, ultrasound, MRI, et cetera, CT, but also at, at the cellular level through cell painting that uh, are forms of data that might be used to inform how these subtypes and some groups are constructed. And then we heard uh, from a tool how artificial intelligence, whether it's machine learning or other approaches can also be done so that these massive amounts of data uh, can be actually be mined and, and driven in a computationally accessible manner. Now, to just a uh, quick tangent, on this use of clusters and some of the limitations uh, that might occur before I go to my fifth area. And to do that, I want to introduce the model that my friend and colleague, Mark McCarthy, who really is one of the giants of type two diabetes genetics in the last couple of decades, um, introduced 
in this paper he wrote uh, for David Loja on personalized medicine. And he introduced the palette model. So here's the painter's palette. And the concept that he was trying to get across, and I think it really is very close to reality, is that as we heard, uh, diabetes is caused by many, many different factors, both genetic and environmental, social determinants of health, of course, diet, exercise, and genetic predisposition, uh, life in utero, many, many things that really together conspire to give somebody hyperglycemia. And when you take all these different factors, hundreds of factors, perhaps thousands, all of which have a very modest effect, and in this palette that really takes all of humanity, and you try to pinpoint which kind of diabetes a person has, each person is a dot in the palette. And it is very difficult to say in the middle of this palette whether a person here or a person there is has diabetes more of a blue kind or a green kind. In a schematic fashion, what he's done here is you have six different risk factors, each of a different color, and then each person is a constellation of those risk factors. And there may be one person who truly has diabetes based on being a preponderance of red compared to the other risk factors. And this person sits here at the edge and is clearly red, but many of them are sort of a gamesh, a composite. And it's very difficult to really try to still down in a very granular fashion how one person differs from the next. And so I think the challenge of precision medicine as illustrated in this model is to try to define where are the edges of the palette where yes, yes, there's a predominance of red, a predominance of orange, a predominance of blue, where you can say that this person's diabetes is really driven by this specific pathway molecular mechanism. But for maybe for the great majority of the population where diabetes is really a composite of many, many different things that may not be so easily done. And the other thing that is shown here or trying to be shown here is of course, that this assignment of a person to a category is not necessarily a static assignment that people do move through life in different metabolic states. And so that has actually been explored uh, with the Scandinavian clusters in a couple of papers, one in Mexico and, and one in Germany, trying to see when, once you assign people to the four different categories that, that the Scandinavian group defined for type two diabetes, to remind this audience, there's severe insulin resistance, severe insulin deficiency, mild obesity related diabetes and mild age related diabetes. What is shown in this uh, Sankey plots is that people do change over time as quickly as three months, one year or two years, people are changing their assigned clusters based on their metabolic state. And the same is true over a five year horizon uh, shown here in a, in a different group. So these cluster assignments are not really static. And so we might be able to try to put someone in a category in a bucket, but we should not assume that that person will stay in that bucket for their lifetime. This has also been illustrated by John Dennis. So John gave a, a great talk this morning and you saw this picture, but, um, but from their, their Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology paper, but I want to just focus on one particular aspect. So here's in the ADOPT clinical trials, so a clinical trial that randomized people with nuanced diabetes to metformin, sulfonylureas, and TZDs. And so what the Exeter group did here, led by John, was to take the Scandinavian clusters and group all participants in the ADOPT trial in their assigned group based on those clusters, and then see how they evolved over time based on the different treatment assignment that took place in the clinical trial. And what you see here, let's just concentrate on the people with severe insulin deficient diabetes. And those people respond very nicely to sulfonylureas because they are enriched for genetic variants or environmental variants that really make their beta cell function not be great. So at disease onset, they respond very well to sulfonylureas. But over time, you see that their slope actually crosses the other two and people do worse over time. And so these people, when found here, might do very well on this particular drug agent, but when found here, they would not. Illustrating again, that these cluster assignments don't necessarily mean that the response to particular therapy is going to be a permanent response. The other point that was made in this paper and John spoke about it this morning is that categorizing people into categories is somewhat helpful, but then using the continuous variable as a predictor, whether it's BMI or age in this case, it is actually a better discriminator. So then another paper that Mark McCarthy wrote, uh, this time was on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Logia and trying to project diabetes over the next 50 years. Um, so I've been blessed by being able to read that. He basically makes the point that if you look at somebody's lifestyle and environment conditioning, how the genetic predisposition, whether it is inherited genetics through the germline or somatic genetics, mutations that may happen, say in your mitochondria or your somatic cells and some early life events, all of them conspire to give somebody a diabetes risk and our ability to deploy precision medicine will have to do in terms of how, how much proportion of the variants we're able to capture. And so what is shown here as a model 
is that in the blue is the true risk of diabetes of a person during different parts of the person's lifetime. Currently, with our current technology and our current ability to measure risk, we are very far away on the green line, very far away from the truth. We have a lot of room to go. And the hope is that by deploying an approach that takes into account genome sequence and maybe discovery omics that are deployed at the time of the person's diagnosis, but then also repeat it over time. So different time points in the life of the individual, you continue to capture that information across multiple axes of biology. Then you might be able to do a better job as shown in the red where the prediction for diabetes gets approaches the truth. And then when it really seems to exceed the risk to the point that the person is about to get diabetes, then you have an intervention as shown in the, in the orange arrow that might, that, risk, that might bring that risk down for the factors that are modifiable. And finally, I think the other area that will continue to grow in exponential fashion is our understanding of mechanism. I think here we're very well blessed by, by being able to query the entire transcriptome of a cell uh, at the single cell level, and again, the epigenomics as well. Uh, here is a schematic uh, that was prepared by a research group with whom I collaborate, and Anna Gloin was the, you know, the key designer. She co-moderated the session this morning, which talks about uh, a grant that we're involved in, in the Accelerating, Accelerating Medicines Partnership, where we are trying to generate data across the relevant cell types, beginning with adipocytes, uh, muscle cells, beta cells, um, and uh, hepatocytes, and by using genome-wide omics, not only for transcription, but also microRNAs and uh, their open chromatin um, and the metabolites and proteins, being able to generate all these data at the cellular level, uh, perturb the cells and perturb genetic elements so that we can have a complete understanding of how a particular variant leads to a molecular phenotype that then impinges on a cellular phenotype and on the organism. And so here's an example of how we need to go simply for genetic association where you just have the correlation of a genetic variant with a phenotype. And then through these experiments that need to be done at scale in the appropriate cell types, at the appropriate developmental stage, in the appropriate metabolic state, you're able to then go from how the genetic variant turns a gene or an off in a particular cell type, how does the transcriptome then change, and then how cells and tissues are affected. And so this accelerated medicines partnership involves a number of academic partners. There's one group at Penn that is led by Patrick Seal with a, a lot of great colleagues there. There is a group that is based in four sites in the United States with a news acronym to denote North, East, West, South, and Michigan, Broad Institute in Boston, Stanford, and UNC. And then another group led by James Miggs that brings in all the top med data, um, and then a portal team that is building all of this to put all the information in one place. And then a number of industry partners and government partners that have decided to sign on and then bring in not only uh, support, but also expertise with a view to really uh, pharmaceutical development. And so all of this information that is being collected in the organism, I think is only gonna explode and then inform how we do precision medicine. If you want to take a look, if those of you who don't know the portal, uh, it is very uh, easy to access. You can just, here's the, the portal for common metabolic diseases. Uh, here's a the URL, there's a number of uh, relevant diseases, type two, type one, uh, stroke, and cor coronary disease. And then the whole idea of this portal is to try to take all the genomic data that is relevant to these diseases, increasingly metagenomic data that goes into the epigenome and it goes into the transcriptome, et cetera, and then put it in a way that is safe, but accessible and can be uh, interfaced by people who don't necessarily have informatic expertise or genetic expertise with the idea that anyone in the world, whether you are working in a lab on a particular animal model, or you are in a pharmaceutical company and you have a particular uh, target in mind, can go in here and ask, what is the human genomic data that supports my hypothesis in a way that you can interact with it um, in a way that is uh, easily accessible. To complete this sort of vignette on the fifth area that is improving understanding of mechanism, it's been an incredible blessing over the last 24 hours to sit here and watch uh, what has been done in the space of beta cell biology. So we've learned a lot about how the microenvironment um, affects how beta cells uh, behave uh, and how it is very important to be able to reconstruct the microenvironment if possible in vitro so that we're not just looking at linear cells in isolation. We had two examples uh, of diseases, whether it's cystic fibrosis um, and then the vasculature, both of them being uh, key to how the microenvironment is configured. We talk a lot about single cell transcriptomics and how that is the, the next frontier for molecular exploration. But we should remember that single cell approaches have been the bread and butter of electrophysiology from the invention of the patch clamp technique. And so it was really wonderful to see Richard Benninger and Patrick McDonald 
and tell us how they've been able to really phenotype, uh, at least through electrical activity, but increasingly other technologies, the cells that are relevant to diabetes development. We've learned how cellular insults, whether it's in the form of the chronic inflammation or the acute inflammation that takes place during pancreatitis, whether it's with cell aging that is different from ER stress or through ER stress uh, that really affect beta cell function relevant to both type one and type two. And then uh, again this morning and some, somewhat yesterday, we learned from people who are really taking the human as the organism to study and through sophisticated uh, methodologies that are available in the form of clamps and so on, uh, we can then better define how human physiology is relevant to diabetes. And of course, we heard about the Radiant study also funded by NIDDK that is trying to assemble uh, nationwide people with atypical diabetes for dedicated study. Now, some things are just not going to change. And this is, I predict here is the, the pessimist in me or the somewhat the cynical person in me saying that some things are continue to vex us. Um, and I don't really see any easy solution in the, in the medium term. Uh, there will be continued pressure to rein in healthcare expenditures, and that will affect particularly countries that have to contend with a lot of diabetic complications. The time constraints we all have when we see our patients will continue to be a problem where we can't spend the time that we need to affect meaningful behavioral change in addition to really do a careful phenotyping of the person in front of us. Uh, we will still have to decide yes, no. We have to decide, do I prescribe, do I not prescribe? Do I order the test, do I not order the test? Our decision making is binary. And so these complex clinical scenarios that take many continuous forms require thresholds and require the ability to be able to say, at this point, I will do X, and at this point, I will do Y. The pandemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes is driven by the environment, the social determinants of health with her from a tool just a half an hour ago. Uh, genetics hasn't changed over the last 50 years. It doesn't evolve, genes don't evolve that fast. And so what's really changed is our environment and that continues to permeate the entire world. And increasingly in low and middle income countries, it will become a major, major challenge. And that will lead to an explosion in diabetic complications. So as we see uh, a complete steep rise of diabetes and obesity incidents in these countries now, within a decade, those people will start seeing blindness and end-stage renal disease and cardiovascular disease and stroke and they don't have the infrastructure to be able to cope with the onslaught of complications that they're facing. Um, and I think there is no question that as the countries with the technologies and the know-how continue to push the envelope on how we can uh, treat and, and manage diabetes in a very sophisticated manner, uh, there's many, many other in the world, the great majority of people in the world who don't have access to the same technology and the same resources. And I think unfortunately health disparities and inequities are going to magnet be magnified. We've seen that with COVID. So as this coronavirus really came to the world, we saw what it did to diabetes and we saw what it did to people who were in resource poor settings. Now, just uh, as we begin, begin try to start bringing this to the close, some uh, words that I would put in mind. When we are researching diabetes and trying to apply big data to try to solve this problem, I think there's two different roads one can take. And I think we need to be clear, both of them are great, both of them are necessary, but we need to be clear what we are trying to do in each case. If you are trying to understand mechanism, if you are trying to really go to the nitty gritty of how a particular gene and its modification affects the cellular state and metabolic state, and that leads to something in the organism, you can bring in all the technology you want to try to elucidate those processes and perhaps use that to identify a target that might be useful for pharmaceutical development. But if what you're trying to do is translate this to the clinic, to the point that it'll be useful at the point of care by anyone, a gen general practitioner anywhere in the world, just keep in mind that these explorations of big data need to be reproducible. It is still science and it still has to stand the scientific method. You need to be able to falsify the hypothesis. Somebody else has to be able to use what you did and replicate your experiment and verify that what you did is correct. It needs to be interpretable. The clinicians need to know what does this mean as far as diabetes or as far as the kind of metabolic state the person is in. It needs to be actionable so that the clinician again can actually do something with information generated and increasingly needs to be sustainable to be adopted in healthcare systems. So if what you're trying to develop through your omics and your big data is on the point of clinical translation, please keep these four things in mind so that the experiments you do can actually make a difference. Quick word on therapeutics, uh, Atul touched on this, it's crazy how we have 12 different drug classes to treat people with diabetes. Uh, the way these decisions are made are not predicated on the molecular pathophysiology of the patient in front of you. They're based on things like cost, 
they're based on things like comorbidities, like the desire to lose weight or not, or not gain weight, uh, like uh, potential side effects. That's how we decide who we put on each one of these different drugs. Uh, but not because I understand the patient in front of me that has this particular subtype of diabetes. And that is because we're using sugar as a thing to modulate. Uh, so this, I think, uh, Will Cephala will recognize is in New Orleans, uh, and it is a store that was open from seven in the morning until 11 at night in the connector that joined our hotel to the ADA scientific sessions when that happened in New Orleans. But we think that it's all about sugar. And so what we really need to do is not so much treat the sugar, the hyperglycemia, here's the route the fronts of famous octet with the different eight organs that contribute to the end result of hyperglycemia, which is a common final pathway, but to which you can arrive through many, many different mechanisms. And if we want to really modify the disease, we can't just address the sugar, we need to do disease modification. And it was great to see uh, Satya present uh, how bariatric surgery is the most effective intervention we have today to reverse the diabetes and pathophysiology. And I think there will be tons of insights that will come from our exploration of bariatric surgery uh, to understand that. And we heard from Carmela how one can protect beta cells and how that really needs to happen in the context of and both type one and type two because metabolic state seems to affect whether those cells are subject to the autoimmune insult or not. Uh, and then of course, uh, if we're gonna talk about cell replacement therapy as a potential way to modify the disease, we need to engineer beta cells that work in a microenvironment that is sustainable with the materials that work and potentially evading uh, the immune system. And then we had a couple, a couple examples of how drug repurposing and metabolomic screens can also help to try to understand, this, to try to develop disease modification. So in closing, there are some challenges to the use of big data we need to be aware of. These effect sizes are very modest to be detected, so that can be a problem. And that's why we have this pallet model where many, many effects, very modest sizes are at work, very difficult to tease apart the ones that really matter. Uh, oftentimes, the information that we capture on a given biological axis is incomplete, and it's at one point in time, and not specifically precise, we're improving and getting better on all of those, but worth keeping in mind. Um, there's a lot of people exploring all this information, and there's a lot of data dredging. It needs to be done according to rigorous statistical standards, and of course, it needs to be reproducible. Uh, so if you're going to do an experiment in big data, then publish your big paper with not, lots of beautiful figures. Um, can somebody else do the work? Can somebody else do the same so that it is really believable? Um, these biological data need to be integrated. This is the portal that I mentioned is trying to break those silos and try to bring all of the information into one place. Um, it is difficult to access some of the tissues. We talked about beta cells, hard to access, you know, deposites, uh, muscle cells, hepatocytes, not so hard. But what about the brain? What about distinguishing between beta cells, alpha cells, somatostatin producing cells, as we heard yesterday? As I mentioned, these results need to be reproducible, interpretable, clinically useful. Uh, we really need a combination of biologists, clinicians, computational people, statisticians, uh, all of them really coming together to try to make sense of this information. Eventually, we will need to translate all of this to the people who are the point of care. So that clinician, often a primary care doctor or nurse practitioner or some other allied health professional in a rural clinic with a computer and little else, that person needs to be able to act on the data. So we need to be able to translate it for them and put it in a place that can be acted on. So what is needed is data sources at scale. We need uh, high throughput methods of both data collection and data generation. Uh, these multidisciplinary teams that I already mentioned, uh, analytics that are rigorous and that really say that this is really uh, defies chance and it is a true finding. Of course, we need to share the data, harmonize it the way a tool explained for the UC system. Uh, we'll have to develop these expert panels that can decide which of these findings are actionable and then be able to educate the workforce so they can be implemented at the point of care. And at the end, we need to really show that all of this matters, that it actually makes a difference for the healthcare system, for the individual, and for society. As an example, I don't have time to go on, but a study in Israel that really tried to take a first step at integrating all of this. Um, a lot of these uh, challenges had envisioned in this precision medicine initiative that was already mentioned that is led by both uh, people in Europe and the United States. So Steve Rich representing the ADA contribution, Paul Franks uh, representing the European contribution. Uh, you can see all the various steps that this group has envisioned as being necessary for the actual implementation of precision medicine. And I will just make the plug that this initiative was initially conceived, it was a brainchild of Will Cephalou, who's now at an ADK, but was then at the ADA when the ADA began championing 
what is now uh, well underway and hopefully will shed some light into the topics, the proceedings of this conference. So my last slide is really about the future. The idea here is that any family then will come in and join a healthcare system or maybe at birth, you know, very early in the person in the life of that individual. And then all of that information will be captured, shown here in genomics, but everything else, all of that will be captured. Genomics, of course, doesn't change. Germline genomics, so it is obtained, can be obtained as early as birth or even earlier, uh, is there at the present of conception, at the moment of conception. And so all that genetic variation can be collected, but then also in the McCarthy analogy, be supplemented with additional metabolic information that you can collect. Some people will come in with their information into the healthcare system, all deposited into the electronic medical record. And what we're trying to do now is to have the scientists who will then correlate all of this information, integrate it, and decide what part of it is actionable, what part of it makes a difference in diabetes. And it may not be all of it, it may be part of it. We need to really come up with the scenarios where it really does matter. And then fed to people who care about prevention so that the person does not develop the disease. And then if you have to intervene here in the form of a surgeon, but maybe also with a drug, then intervene in a way that is appropriate and tailored to the person in front of you. So with that, I just want to thank uh, our research team here in Boston, uh, many mentors, collaborators that are really too numerous to mention, many consortia uh, where we participate, a number of funding sources, and my HMS professor and the four daughters we have together. Thank you very much and happy to join the panel. That was outstanding. Appreciate it. Uh, Tool, excellent talk, if I could get you on video. So uh, let's uh, discuss, we have about 30 minutes between the both of you, and uh, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the first question, and maybe both of you can answer it, but um, Dr. Butte, I'm going to challenge you on a comment you made. Uh, you basically say um, data will change guidelines, but the guidelines have really evolved to address not just glucose, as uh, Dr. Flores has shown, but to address the comorbidities, the complications with the receptor agonist, SGLT, and they're being suggested because of guidelines, but uh, these are being suggested because of comorbidity CVD independently of glucose. So you made a statement that data will change guidelines. And if you refer to the real world data, the practice of diabetes in the real world currently is really inadequate control. In fact, it's, it's suboptimal. So how will using that data really change the guidelines so that we can actually achieve best control. And that's so if you can clarify that, that would be one of the questions I'm going to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I've seen some of these questions already coming up. So if, if uh, you'll humor me for a second, I had some backup slides. So I'll just share this one. Now, I'm not ready to give you the answer here yet, but I did mention we have nine years of longitudinal data. So of course, we could look at major adverse cardiovascular events. We could look at eye health, kidney event. And what we're seeing here is just the first pass, Tom and Rohit have been working on this, that we can literally compare all monotherapies, dual therapies, and triple therapies used on every single patient in the entire University of California, right? And looking at couple of my survival curves as to uh, uh, the incidence of any of those side effects, here, right? So we're definitely doing this, okay? We have all the data. In fact, by the way, we can look at the cost of the drugs here too, right? Something Picori just, I think by federal law, isn't allowed to look at the cost. We're coming up with metrics, for example, you know, improvement in MACE risk per dollar, right? Or uh, a, a, a continued normalization of creatinine per dollar, or the creatinine is a long, uh, late, late stage one, for example. So we can look at the cost of the therapies along with nine years of longitudinal data. And this is high resolution data. This isn't just claims data, right? We have every single dose of everything here. So we're gonna get there. I'm not saying we're there yet. I'm not gonna give you the answers here but these are the papers you're gonna be seeing from the University of California in the next 12 months. Maybe uh, uh, does that, that might start to answer the question. Of course, diabetes care is much more than just the complications and certainly more than glucose as Jose was saying too. Um, and uh, the question came up in the chat, what happens if a patient leaves our care? Absolutely, we have patients coming in and out all the time, but we do have about 800,000 primary care patients in our system. Um, and, and then all the rest of the millions are tertiary quaternary care. So people are going to be constantly coming in and out. It is by no means perfect, okay? By no means, it's not an integrated health system. It's not a single pair as we know, uh, but it is a lot of data on, a, on millions of people. So we get them when we have them and we don't have them when they go, they go somewhere else. Jose, do you have a comment on that? Well, man, I think there's a number of things that, that I've, I'm sure Atul is thinking of. So, so one is, when you talk about the UC system, 
uh, and say that you have the real data there, you have to understand that a lot of those prescription decisions are actually being led by the guidelines that, that you criticize, right? So a lot of what you call real world data is actually being informed by the guidelines that the, that the experts have put together. So, 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 you know, there's a little bit of a circular piece there um, to keep in mind. And of course, uh, you know, trying to balance what is an uncontrolled experiment uh, with all the potential confounders, with the power of very, very large data and very granular uh, follow-up. Um, and so, you know, there are caveats that I'm sure your team is aware of. Um, and I think it really needs to be interpreted in the context of all of the information that arises, including well-controlled clinical trials. I think it'll be very hypothesis generating. Um, and then it will be up to the, the academic and the government uh, partners to really come up and say, what are the studies that really need to address the um, areas that are not clearly established so that we can make decisions that are based on the best data possible. But it really, I think it is going to be the next wave of data generation. There's no question, no one can stop this wave. That's a great point. And let me just add on to what Jose is saying. Uh, absolutely, there are guidelines here. Uh, in fact, matching patients to guidelines is often kind of an exercise. Uh, for example, we noticed that we talked to one doc in our system, I'm not even gonna say which campus, that had learned when they were in training to hit, hit diabetes patients hard. So they start patients on many meds and then peel them back, okay? Almost the opposite of the treatment guidelines here, right? So yes, there's all the treatment guys, but it's also this bias to how they were trained and the, how that person was trained. Um, so there is a, still a lot of practice variation. Hope, I, I wish more of it fit the guidelines, but amazingly, a lot of it doesn't. Norm, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks. I'm just uh, looking at the Q&A. And uh, uh, one of the questions that I think people would like a little clarity on, uh, Dr. Boot, is, is the interface of clinical data and research data and how one frees yeah. up data for research purposes, respecting institutional review, human subjects, policies, and privacy. Absolutely. And uh, I promised that I'd talk about it here. So I got in the backup slide for that. So this is how it actually works here. Uh, so on the left here, uh, you can see uh, a fully identifiable database, right? That's what we start with. Uh, so I think of these as bookends. So fully identifiable on the left. And then on the right is what we're going to call legally de-identified in quotes. And so what that means is we start with the fully identified we remove the 18 categories of HIPAA identifiers and no text and no images, and we shuffle the dates. Okay, so for example, two things that are two days apart uh, are still gonna be two days apart, but you don't know which dates are. If you shuffle the encounter dates, then you cannot re-identify. So you, there are dates, but they're shuffled. So you can't uh, link them back. Now that database on the right has been studied by external counsel, by UC uh, Office of General Counsel, and that has been blessed as legally de-identified. And then all the UC health, so our health campus IRB directors have looked at that and said that is so de-identified that it is non-human subjects research. Okay, so now we got one database that's fully identifiable on the right, on the left. You got one that is fully le legally de-identified on the right. And then anything in between that needs the exact zip code, that needs uh, the exact dates are what in HIPAA we call limited data set. And so we can generate those but 99% of people need either the one on the left or the one on the right. Now, the way this works is researchers work with any one of our campuses first. So you see LA researcher would get their OMOP queries. OMOP is a vendor neutral standard for storing patient data. It goes back 15 years with the FDA and Columbia University. They get those queries to work on one campus. And then when they're ready to scale, we spin up a virtual machine in the cloud, which I'm gonna show you a screenshot on in a second. You gotta sign a data use agreement saying you're not gonna download the data you're not going to give it to a company. Uh, so, you know, you, there's still an attestation there you have to meet. Uh, we run this in the cloud. So it's a secure cloud. Uh, Microsoft Azure is the name of that cloud. The tool is called Databricks, which is a, uh, for the data aficionados, it's like Jupyter Notebooks, but it's a company. Uh, and then you got R, Tableau, SQL, Queries, Windows, Linux is all available. You can upload your scripts and run, but you can't download data. And that is what we'd call safe, respectful, regulated research use of clinical data. Here's just one screenshot of that. This is literally a query I can write, just counts how many encounters we had. And on the arrow there, you can see someone who wants to build an AI tool here can train on 165 million ambulatory visits, okay? 
you could just see that the raw numbers right there. It's probably a couple of weeks old. It's probably a little bit more, obviously, from there. So this is real and live and open for UC <coughs> researchers. One of the questions came up in the chat. Of course, we work with pharma and biotechs on what are called real world evidence questions. But we typically will export the models or the answers to their questions and our questions, but we do not export the data except in extremely obscure cases. For example, to support an FDA filing, we have to be ready to, uh, that FDA filing for that pharma or biotech might need some raw data. And so um, uh, we have to be prepared for that. So we have these paths thought out, but this is already blessed and up and running and available for researchers in University of California. No, no, no more discussion needed with the IRBs or any of those kinds of folks. Excellent. Okay, well, we can start answering some questions, and this is from Dr. Half, and this will be for both of you. So, um, Dr. Flores, we'll ask you to start with this, and then we'll get Dr. Butte's response. And it was basically, what are your thoughts on how to tease out accurate, accurately the compliance, patient resilience over time, and impact of key life events on disease management as we move forward? So that this is where I think the model that I think you know, was introduced sort of by Mark, by many of us, Mark McCarthy, by many of us embrace is that yes, you can use genetics as the initial anchor because genetics is there from the very beginning and doesn't change and kind of give you at least you know a 30 to 40 percent uh, idea of what things are going to look like. But then over the time of the person at regular intervals, we need to collect the variables that matter, and they can be things like anthropomorphics in terms of BMI, etc. They can be uh, metabolomics or you know or, or biomarkers, but they need those need to be cheap and easy to get. You know, could, you could imagine C peptide or or things of that sort. Maybe anything that the metabolomics proteomics platforms are going to reveal. Um, and in addition, maybe environmental or life type things that happen. You know, you can talk about stress levels. You can talk about diet. You can talk about exercise. So all those need to be collected over time because they modify the risk profile in a way that it really captures the entirety of factors that together contribute to the person developing diabetes. And so the idea would be that the work that needs to happen in the next five to 10 years is determining which of those factors really matter, whether they're endogenous or exogenous. And then well, how do you integrate them into a predictive model that seems to be robust to ethnicity, robust to uh, country, robust to the different situations. Um, and that really moves with age. And so then as the person touches on the healthcare system, they can have an updated risk profile done. Um, and for those in whom the particular mode of diabetes development falls in a very specific pathway, where there's a pathway that is predominant. So these are people in the palate that are at the edges of the palate with one color that really seems to shine. Then for those people, there might be a targeted intervention that is based on their biology, not on comorbidities or cost or side effects, but on their biology um, for whom the intervention seems to be particularly tailored. And many many people will not uh, fall into such a distinct category. So I think we need to be open to the idea that precision medicine may not be something that can be applied to every individual on the planet, but for those for whom there is a predominant pathophysiologic derangement. Dr. Yeah, I think uh, I tried to answer it in the uh, Q&A. Um, I think the first real point is to make questions about compliance and life events uh, more part of standard of care, I think, right? So if, it, if it's not asked, uh, a doc or a nurse isn't gonna know and it's not gonna get documented and then we don't have that data. So I think um, a part of it is in a research world, we can ask a lot about these questions, we can follow cohorts, but then we kind of lose it in the clinical world. So we got this catch 22 here. And so I think the first challenge is really to show clinical relevance in smaller, cohorts of, of asking these questions, of documenting them, getting them into the electronic health record. And then we can use this kind of real world evidence uh, type of approach, real world data to, to study it. Now for us, again, we're going, we're going crazy over diabetes in the University of California because we really want to target that first. Uh, so we do have the latitude longitude here. We also have indications like, are they filling uh, their drugs, uh, their prescriptions? Uh, are they missing appointments, right? So Remember in Epic, you don't just document the visits you have, you also have the visits they canceled. Uh, and so are those location dependent? Uh, we can now map them to uh, modes of transportation. We're not the best at asking how they get to the hospital, but we can at least see how close they are to public transportation and all the rest. And I think the future for me is to really uh, come up with causal reasons why someone might be out of control so we can start to target them. Um, the area deprivation index is just the beginning, but it's a single number. But 
based on the US census, right? You have almost a hundred different indications of measurements for each census tract in the United States, right? Where, how close is the closest grocery store? What kind of restaurants are there? Things like that. So uh, we're, again, we're just starting this journey. Uh, but I, I think, you know, summarizing this kind of, these kinds of data elements as social determinants of health is almost not serving it enough, right? It's, uh, uh, there's so much richness there uh, that I think the same kind of richness we go crazy trying to finalize the human genome sequence, which finally got done this week. I think we should go crazy over social determinants now. And look, I'm a genomics person. I, I, I started my career this way. Uh, but seeing these differences just based on location, it's striking and uh, something we legitimately have to do something about. I guess the one thing maybe I would qualify a tool is that is that when you talk about the uh, geographic areas, you know, that's a correlation. That is not causality. So when you say we just need to move the person from Sacramento to to, uh, you know, a uh, nice area of near San Francisco, that may or may not do the case because it could be many of the other things that they bring with them that has nothing to do with geographic location. So, right. Absolutely right. And I also agree. Uh, we're straight because again, nine years of data. Many of our patients have moved already in nine years. Uh, that we're starting to now look at that. Uh, is, can we get their address and actually look again? Natural experiments here. These are not randomized. You know, it's these are not randomized clinical studies. But it is also hard to run a randomized clinical study moving people from one town to another. It's, you know, who would fund that? But if we have a lot of people who've moved over nine years, maybe we can start to see uh, just did the movement itself change patterns, change behavior? Right, but there's collinearity. Um, it's this worth asking a question. But there's collinearity yeah. with the moves, right? So maybe somebody moves because they have a better job and because they are making more money and they're able to have a better diet and then they move to near a Whole Foods market as opposed to you know some convenience store and so or a food desert. So so you know, so moving along, you know, the problem with these natural experiments is that you really need to take into account many factors that you have you're not controlling. Absolutely. And we would never say to move a patient in the end. That's not a therapeutic option for us. Uh, even if, if a trial shows it works here, right? We don't have the money to buy people houses uh, in the University of California. But um, uh, I think it's really getting to the, what is it about that neighborhood that potentially could be controlled? For example, you see Kaiser Permanente uh, at least putting a lot of press on millions of dollars they're putting into housing, right? Uh, you see Geisinger with their fresh grocery uh, initiative in Pennsylvania, right? Um, now health systems do that. I'm not sure they have a lot of data to justify that, uh, but let's put some, let's get the evidence base on what is it about these neighborhoods that make a difference here beyond just the one number? Maybe I'll jump in, Will, with uh, another question. I'm seeing a couple of themes that are converging. Let's talk about decision-making platforms, precision tools, and let's have you comment, uh, Atul and Jose, on two aspects of this. One is the operation of the health system, if I can call it that, realizing that sometimes we have systems and other times we don't have real systems, we have parts. But quite aside from that, and let's think across different kinds of countries that organize their systems differently. Type two diabetes, for example, is often cared for predominantly by primary care specialists, not highly trained subspecialists. Uh, how will these tools be integrated into health systems? And the second layer of this is what is the health professional of tomorrow? How do health professionals adapt as we think about what they will look like 20 years from now to computerization, decision support in a way that could completely overwhelm our notions of one uh, decision at a time patient-related analysis and decision-making. Okay, so I, I, let me yes, take a Oh, go ahead, Jose. Go ahead. I want to take a step to just uh, the way that I envision the thing happening in a very concrete way. So let's say, let's say that over the next decade, we show that using genetics, we can begin to identify clusters of diabetes by which different, different pathways are predominant in how somebody gets diabetes then uh, using integrating additional data that comes in that involves social determinants of health and biomarkers and metabolomics in a way that is tractable, we can refine those models and identify the people who are at the extreme of the cluster where they have a predominant form of diabetes, such that when somebody gets diagnosed with diabetes on the basis of hyperglycemia, which is just a blood sugar measurement, all that data exists 
for, and it's been shown that it matters in terms of medication treatment and surveillance for complications so that the person is given a label for type, type 2 diabetes 2A, 2B, or 2C because they fall on a bucket that is a unique or specific <coughs> matter. So let's say that we've generated the data that supports that kind of decision. We've shown that it matters as far as medication selection and surveillance, and we've shown that it is cost effective. And so all of that gets integrated. So that way, then you have the primary care practitioner in a rural clinic in, I'll just pick South Dakota, uh, and they have the patient. The patient walks in with a high sugar level and the diagnosis of diabetes, because the genomic information is already in place. You can obtain it you know, very soon. The entire population will have genomic information. It's easy and cheap, can be done once in the lifetime of the person, so that'll exist. Then the computer will spit out and say, this person with, now, with new hyperglycemia likely has type 2 diabetes 2C. And then, because we've shown that people with diabetes 2C are better responders to GLP-1 receptor agonists based on the predominant pathway, and this person happens to fall on the part of the curve that says that this is the predominant form, then the suggestion will be for this nuanced diabetic, may or may want to start metformin because it's cheap, safe, and effective, but you definitely need to start a GLP-1R on top. And so the person, the clinician, all they need to know is that the person has diabetes and that it's already embedded in the system as to how the person is to be treated. And they don't need to think about all the big data. They don't need to think about all these things that we've done. They just need to know that diabetes is the end result of many different pathways and that there are particular people who may be better treated in a different way. So I think that's the way I can see the thing happening. And so what needs to happen for that is that we generate the evidence in a way that tells you what, in what parts this is actionable, in what parts of diabetes precision medicine can be applied, where is it effective, and how it makes a difference and then just implement it across a system. And, and can I just follow up with uh, the system part? Uh, it's great to hear about the University of California system, but most systems are chopped up in little pieces. And uh, so how do you uh, create a system where these kinds of data are widely accessible across jurisdictions? Okay, this so is not you're asking extremely, yeah, you're asking a complicated question, right? Uh, look, I'm an academic, right? I write papers and grants, but I see these things, these systems coming together when there is a business reason to do it, right? If the only reason to bulk data share is so academics can write better papers and grants, I'm going to posit it never is going to happen. But if you can actually bring, if you can actually show that you can save a health system millions, if not soon billions, then all of a sudden it happens and it happens in a hurry. Uh, and so I'm going to argue, again, I'm an academic, the best way to make this happen is to find a business case for it. For example, uh, again, there's a lot of things I haven't talked about. Uh, pick biologics, like anti-TNF-alpha inhibitors, right? Not really used in diabetes, of course. But all of a sudden, we notice UCLA is using one and UCSF is using the other one, right? Why don't we figure out the one we're going to really use and let's all buy it together, right? A decision that, you know, the United States is trying to figure out for Medicare and others but there's no reason we as health systems can't get a better price by working together. So we have an enormous effort called leveraging scale for value, right? Now these are business reasons to have the data together. But once you have the data there for that reason, I can tell you from experience, creating the research version that is much easier, right? Than trying to build it from scratch. So find the business reason for this to happen first. It can't just be academic saying they want a nature or New England Journal of Medicine paper because it's not compelling enough. These are, in the United States, I guess, I know this is an international audience here. In the United States, we have a competitive healthcare system, okay? And we seemingly like that, okay? Like we love a competitive justice system, okay? But we have a competitive health, health healthcare system where our systems make billions of dollars and that revenue means something. Then we put advertisements, billboards next to our competitors trying to take patients from them, right? An academic that just says they want to get better papers or grants does has essentially no voice on that compared to the, those billboards. Now, what I see is the future state in the United States, and we use this analogy all the time, is I don't see a single database, central database with all of this data across the United States, but I see maybe a dozen of them. An analogy we like to use is Star Alliance, okay? In the United States, uh, 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 essentially around the world, we have Star Alliance, right? United didn't buy Lufthansa. Lufthansa didn't buy United, but what did they agree to? They sell each other's product. They seemingly somehow work with bags, usually get transferred seamlessly, and they share a lot of data with each other, right? 
And but there's a business reason for those two. Actually, they were competitors of certain markets to work together. And now we don't just have Starlights, we have Sky Team, we have One World, we got three of them major, right? So I can imagine 12 of these forming in the United States someday, right? We might not share at UCSF with Stanford, but we can share with San Diego. We might share with someone else who's not a competitor with us. And I can see a patchwork, a, a hopscotch pattern across the United States where folks that systems that feel less threatened about sharing will share for business reasons first. Then the data is easily available for research. So it's a complicated answer to a complicated question. So Tua, before you go, I know you have to go soon, but I have a question and maybe Jose can also provide a, um, a, a comment. But you mentioned uh, some very interesting data with the area deprivation index, social determinants of health, the non-biologic factors. You've identified this as a problem, but yet you're working toward medication and guidelines, looking at real data. Just project for me, how are you going to use this? If this is as a, if suggesting that where you live is a drug effect, how is the UC system, for example, going to be proactive in addressing this and, and strategies? That's a great question. Great question. Okay. So look, we, we also can't build grocery stores here, right? But let me just give you the stupidest thing we can do first. Okay. I just want to search across all geo locations in, in California. I want to find the pockets of five or 10 that have a large number of people, our patients living, let's say in a multi-block radius, that many of those folks are missing appointments. And then I just want to send a diabetes bus there to handle the appointments there, okay? So that would be the simplest thing I could do with latitude, longitude, uh, error deprivation, and looking at missed encounters. Maybe not even getting an A1C, right? But we know they're our patient. We're not even getting that A1C. Again, A1C is just a marker of things, right? It's not a, a measure. It's not a real thing. But I, I just at least want to find where do they live so I can send and put a diabetes bus in the right place to at least get the encounters completed there, right? we got a lot more to figure out too. And look, uh, uh, all I'm saying is let's put as much creativity and innovation into solving this as we do into drug discovery, okay? Because I don't have all the answers here, but I think it's worthy of us putting some effort in. Jose, you want to comment? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I, you know, I, I, I think um, there's a comment in the chat that is really interesting about geographic location and these determinants of health, which is an experiment that was done how when when people uh, had a ge geographic area that is not really so much about geography, but it's about what goes with that geography. It's about the kind of access to uh, healthy food and you know, as opposed to food insecurity. It's about areas to be able to exercise. It's about being able to have the time to do those things, access to primary care and prevention. So, so I think the solution has to be the solution for diabetes and the world at, at the sort of the planet level is not going to be genetics or omics or treatment. It's about prevention, and that all of that is environmental. The genetics is just the predisposition. All of that is environmental. In the same way that 50 years of a sedentary lifestyle and hypercaloric superabundance has led to the epidemics we see today, we know that when you modify uh, a lifestyle through an intensive lifestyle intervention, as shown in the diabetes prevention program, you can overcome your genetic risk. And we've seen this over and over again, that when you took people with different uh, profiles of genetic risk, and you take the people with the highest genetic risk for diabetes, when they're exposed to the intensive lifestyle in intervention in the, in the diabetes prevention program, that genetic risk goes back to baseline because the environment is what really matters. So, you know, we can talk until we're blue in the face about omics and diabetes and understanding diabetes pathophysiology, but if we really care about public health, it's gonna have to be about governments and, and healthcare systems really trying to counteract the pernicious effect of the environment. And what is about to happen in China and in India and then in the Middle East is already happening and, and eventually in Africa is gonna be devastating unless we can get a hold of it. Thank you. Well, Norm, do we want to move on to the general panel? I think we could uh, do that. I think yeah. uh, Dr. Boot is about ready to uh, move on. So uh, we certainly wanna thank you, Atul. For uh, thank you for Thanks your for contribution. Having me here. Great discussion. Yeah, right. thank you thank very you. much. So at this time, what I'll do is um, ask um, uh, Cromella, Mikey, and Miriam if you could turn on your videos, and we'll um, start the general panel discussion. So, do we have everybody? We do. Great. 
So hi again, and thank you to uh, to the, to you for uh, agreeing to be on this uh, sort of bring it all together panel. Um, we're trying to fuse uh, the themes from the previous sessions. Uh, how do we think about heterogeneity in beta cells and uh, extend that all the way and backwards uh, heterogeneity among peoples and uh, pop population context that they're living in? So very easy job for you. And uh, we want to uh, uh, highlight the fact to everybody that uh, our, our panelists uh, did some previous thinking, uh, sort of four major areas of thinking. So we're going to sort of probe the panel around these four major questions that you yourselves thought were interesting to discuss. And, uh, and uh, we'll ask you to, some of you to take the lead on the discussion and see if others want to comment. So uh, I think that's the way we'll uh, work this discussion. The first area will uh, uh, be primarily for Jose and uh, Mikey, but uh, but you know others feel free, and it and really has to do with uh, how our at least more detailed molecular and cellular understanding is going to inform clinical care issues. So I realize that's that's rather broad. Uh, but it, it but it relates to what is measurable, uh, what can be integrated in any kind of pipeline, whether we're thinking innovatively moving forward, not quite ready for prime time, but should be prioritized for development, and what shouldn't, and how that interacts with emerging diagnostics and therapeutics uh, for individuals who are either at risk or have uh, various phases of disease. So uh, do I see, uh, Mikey, do I, I see? Could, yeah, uh, I, see I can moving. probably, I mean, we've had these discussions like with the panel a little bit, which was helpful because really the, what we've heard in the symposium is in the first day, a lot about innovative cell models, animal models, just new innovative experimental approaches to probe mechanisms to identify, you know, how do beta cells really work? And, you know, there's similar research in the area um, of other tissues that are relevant for diabetes. So there's still a lot of discovery research into, you know, how does it actually all work? How do organs actually talk to each other? And then in the second half, we've heard about the precision medicine and the question, how can we actually use um, patient data, um, environmental factors, you know, then can we maybe model that the impact of these factors in these experimental systems? So to me, I like to sort of conceptually break it down into like um, two pieces. I think there is still a place for discovery research. So, you know, if we now just say we just have to take patient data, kind of what uh, Rosé described as you know, we're using these cell models to introduce these genetic variants to go from variant to gene, from gene to function, that might be like too myopic to think that that's going to like just, um, you know, solve all the problems. And I'm not saying that that isn't an interesting line of research, but I do firmly believe there is still a place for just understanding how beta cells work, understanding how adipocytes work. And we might actually discover new ways of how we can prevent or intervene in disease by really understanding these processes. And this is where I think a lot of the um, work that we've heard um, in the sessions yesterday comes into play. And you know, as, as one example, um, when you think about type one diabetes and what Carmela also talked about that there is beta cell stress and we still don't understand how a stressed beta cell presents antigens, you know, why is it that that stress factor maybe um, is relevant to whether you get disease or not? And then if we could find ways, um, you know, really understand that better, you know, for the beta cell, that's something we don't understand at this point, then there could be completely new ways of intervention that maybe are not driven by genetics or patient stratification data. So that I think is the one bucket. And then the other side in my mind is utilizing these, you know, then mostly human systems to go from genotype to um, gene to function, and then maybe to precision medicine and think about pipelines, how you can go from the patient to the cell model back to the patient. So 
um, I think discussion wise to me, both have really still a firm place and both stand a chance of um, bringing better therapeutic approaches in the future. So, and then um, maybe to say, you know, is it, should we just use human cell models? Should we just use animal models? We've actually discussed this a little bit amongst ourselves. And it seems like each one of these systems have their place, you know, each one has strengths and weaknesses. So we kind of agreed upon saying, actually, you know, maybe that is a mute discussion to say, should we just do work in iPSCs? Should we just, you know, should we not to work in animal models anymore. You know, all of that is eventually teaching us how things work and um, they each are important. So I think I'm gonna just close there with sort of trying to connect the two yeah. Yeah. Um, aspects of the symposium. Uh, Jose, uh, uh, additional thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I completely agree with Mikey. I mean, I think it's, it's helpful for those who don't do genomics all the time to try to, try, try to put all the genomic discoveries in context. So, you know, there has been an explosion, hundreds of variants now associated with type 2 diabetes. Now, there's a couple of things that one can do with that. The first one is, regardless of mechanism and regardless of function, you know that people who carry these variants have a higher risk of A, B, or C, whether it's type 2 diabetes or decreased beta cell function, insulin resistance. And you might be able to try to use that to stratify people. And that has met modest success in terms of those strata actually making a difference but you can go ahead and stratify people before you know anything about mechanism. But the other insight that comes with the genomic information is that nature through genetic variation has shown that altering that base pair in a human makes a difference as far as phenotype. So nature has shown you that whatever tweaking took place that leads to that DNA alteration that actually makes a difference in a person's phenotype. Now, what we don't know is how that is the case. And so the really laborious work that is taking place, and I think, you know, can totally harness the beta cell expertise that has been assembled in this meeting, is to begin to make sense from how that variant actually leads to a change in function with the goal of converging on pathophysiologic pathways, some of which may have been already known through traditional biological approaches, but some of them will be completely novel, that might lead to the node where an intervention might be possible, whether it's with an existing drug or a new drug. And so the, the discovery piece is fascinating, but it is not easy. You know, we, it's very easy to, to genotype people in mass and, and have these associations, but then to go from variant to function is a big, big bottleneck. And so what things like the AMP PTD, the AMP, uh, the Accelerated Medicine Partnership is trying to do, and many people are trying to do, is try to come up with high throughput, scalable approaches yeah. that will try to go not from one gene or variant at a time, but kind of try to do it uh, in bulk in the cells that do matter. And then as Mike yeah. said, once you know that, you might be able then to go back to the patient and say, actually, based on the genomic information and the experiment of nature, I now understand which pathway is actually affected. And here is this metabolite, this drug, this small molecule, this lifestyle or dietary intervention that I can use to treat that pathway in specific people. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a complete closing of the circle that Mikey was alluding yeah. to. Let me just throw out an additional element of this that I think uh, I hear talked about quite a bit, and that is the translational barriers, uh, effectiveness of uh, translating what without in any way uh, denying the nuance of having different species inform our understanding of physiology and pathobiology and, and uh, how uh, genetics and and pathways have evolved, but yet a frustration at the same time that certain bottles have been more effective than others in going from experimental systems to humans. So in line with what you've said, are we at a point where we're willing to make harder recommendations about which experimental systems are in fact more predictive? If we're trying to go from, uh, if, to go to function, predict function, where should we be looking um, any thoughts on that in terms I mean, of preclinical systems? I have I, some thoughts. On Carmela, that. Go ahead. Carmela. Yeah. So, you know, I, being in a, in the type one field, there are, there's no other field. I think where our, our animal models get more criticism. Uh, so I think it's good to just acknowledge that up front. Uh, but that being said, if you speak to someone at a pharmaceutical company, you may have an interesting target. 
uh, or, or, or suite of assets, for example, the first question they want to know is, well, what did the, what did the NOD study show? So I think that it's, um, although it would be great if we had um, mouse models that more fully recapitulated uh, disease in people, uh, that would be wonderful. It, it would be great if everything that worked in the NOD translated into people. That's not the case. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's probably premature to think that we can't get to a clinical trial without preclinical data. Um, because there has to be a starting place. Now, that being said, I think we have to quickly develop models uh, where we can, um, we can move forward into human model systems. Um, I, I also, I think in this, uh, in this regard, because I think it, it sort of it dovetails with what Mike and, uh, and Jose said about um, different model systems to be able, able to go after mechanism. Um, you know, I'm struck by how many trials we have performed, certainly in type 1 diabetes that didn't work. Um, they're small in comparison to the large studies that have been performed in type 2 diabetes where there have been different, different successes. But, you know, the, the conversation that preceded this one was about EMR and uncontrolled experiments. But we have a lot of material from very controlled experiments that I'm not actually sure has been um, harvested in a way with newer tools that have been brought to bear uh, in recent years to be able to understand what drives some of this heterogeneity um, and differences in responders and non-responders. So, um, you know, I think going back to what we've done and hasn't worked or has worked and trying to understand things with different sets of tools is a really nice way yeah, for us to nice. be able to address the beta cell heterogeneity and responses uh, that we see. Miriam, anything to add to this uh, particular discussion? Uh, just one thing comes to mind that I think is a real challenge and um, is that uh, there's so much important uh, understanding around biology from the uh, cellular models, but I think something that's a challenge is having biomarkers that uh, can be relevant in patients to be able to connect. Uh, so, for example, beta cell stress, how do we have any sense of beta cell stress in a patient? You know, we don't have very good ways right now of assessing that. So maybe also thinking about as we look to the future, ways that, you know, it, and it's obviously really hard, but are there ways that we can connect um, and identify biomarkers that then could have translational use? Thank you. Will, to you. Uh, well, Miriam, that's an excellent segue into my next question. <laughs> and I'll let you and Carmilla address this. So we are at the end of this symposium and, and now talk about panel discussions. So we want to use everything that's been discussed the last day and a half to now project far, uh, forward. Jose has given us his prediction in 30 minutes. Great job. So now I want to ask, so based on what we have now and that we want to go in precision medicine approach. And again, we've heard a lot of concerns today about the standards of care and, uh, and, and maybe they're too prescriptive and maybe that's not what we're doing. So if you had to now move forward and I've heard a lot about the subtypes today, how would you begin that characterization? And again, you mentioned biomarkers. Uh, what do we have as far as biomarkers that you can suggest? Do we need more point of care uh, to Jose's point at this point? Do we need to start doing some clustering at least initially? Um, do we need decision to support or is it all of the above? What do we do now, let's say, to begin tomorrow to address this? We know this, the, the, what we're using now perhaps is not ideal. So, let me start with you and Carmela, and then we'll go to Mikey and Jose. So how would you approach that? Okay, I, can, I mean, this is such an <laughs> important, difficult question. The, th the thing that I keep thinking about throughout uh, yesterday and today is that I, I think we need um, more data to study that is the type of data that, you know, and this is difficult to come by, but I think we need, for example, clinical trial data just to be made more readily available. A beautiful example of where data that's become available has been so widely used is the UK Biobank. And if we could just have more large data sets where we could, um, you know, John Dennis you know, has done incredible analyses in using clinical trial data with important insights, but we really need more of that. And we need that in, within those clinical trials, more uh, deeper phenotyping. So we need um, metabolomics, we need uh, genomics. And, um, and I think also another uh, biomarker that I think is already showing to be useful, but we don't, aren't probably not fully utilizing is C-peptide and uh, being able to have better studies where we can understand, you know, have a clearer sense of uh, how to interpret a C-peptide level and um, 
in, in longitudinal follow-up in patients where there's been C-peptide level to, you know, there's been some work in this space, but I think there needs to be more standardization of the laboratory measurement to allow broader utilization. Well. I, I completely agree with what Miriam was saying. You know, I think if you're thinking about the beta cell, the best, most reproducible biomarker that we have uh, is C-peptide. And I think that um, oftentimes we, I was struck by the conversation that uh, it was the end of the last panel yesterday where we, I think someone suggested maybe we're just classifying diabetes completely incorrectly and that we shouldn't be so caught up on this binary classification system. Uh, or, or there are multiple branches at this point now, and it should be about pathophysiology, right? So I think sort of one of the most important themes of this uh, meeting, I believe, is that um, there, there are certainly forms of type one diabetes where there's impaired beta cell function, but that's a keystone of uh, some different uh, types of type two diabetes as well. So I think that we probably have missed opportunities to completely phenotype the beta cell, um, now, from a very pragmatic perspective, it's not possible to do that when you have thousands of people enrolled in clinical trials to do the gold standard phenotyping. Um, but I do think understanding at a very basic level how you correlate beta cell function and whether it's impaired with a response to a treatment is step one. Um, now, for all the other fancier things that uh, we envision as biomarkers of beta cell stress, I think there are candidates, um, but they need, I think, better validation um, as a community, we need to be on the same page about assays. Um, and I think that, you know, it's not particularly exciting, um, but people need samples to do discovery work in, and they need samples to do validation work in, and validation needs to be done across multiple laboratories. So I think that really that lack of a biomarker of beta cell stress and death um, is, we have a tremendous gap in validation, sharing samples, working across um, different laboratories to try to develop these assays. Um, I don't think those are in, all of those problems can be overcome, um, but I, I think if we decide that that's a priority to the community, we just need to put resources to it. Dr. Flores. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just go back to the, the distinction I made earlier in my talk, and that is biomarkers to understand mechanism, then throw in all the technology and we can get expensive. You can, you know, you can do the kinds of things that Michael Snyder talked about in number of people and try to distill what is really going to be important. And you do the microbiome and you do every metabolite and you do C peptide and multiple measurements and challenge and clamps and all of that. That's fine for mechanism, but, but it is not for clinical translation that will never be implemented at the point of care and definitely not in low and middle income countries. And we are doing a disservice, I think, to the global burden of diabetes when we try to think that somehow having six different metabolites measured in different platforms and doing microbiome assessments um, and C-peptide with some, you know, some sort of sophisticated phenotyping uh, is going to solve diabetes. So if you are thinking of clinical translation, you need to be able to distill down of all that exploration, what are the things that are scalable, affordable, and informative? and do it in a way that is, again, reproducible, interpretable, actionable, and sustainable. Um, and so, so I think we need to distinguish, you know, and when you talk about the investments that we make, you know, let's be clear, when are we talking about discovery science and are we, when are we going to talk about implementation? If I could respond to that, I, I mean, I think your point is a really important one, Jose, uh, but there's, I think before we get to a point where we say there are different, uh, different clusters or phenotypes or groups of individuals who may or may not benefit from a particular therapy, which is the clinically translational question, right? Um, you have to do the discovery on the back end to be able to separate that out. Um, and I think that beta cell function is just one anchoring point, but there are lots of other disease pathways that lead to diabetes, right? Um, so I think that being able to understand, we have these, these very simplified flow charts that say, start this drug first, if your patient's A1C doesn't go down, go to this one. That doesn't tell us anything about pathophysiology. Right. Correct. Yeah, I totally agree. Mikey, any comment? Yeah, maybe like um, you know, one one place where like maybe these um, more innovative cell models could come in, especially the human ones, where we can use gene editing and really create defined genotypes, you know, in iPSCs or um, other um, cell models. If we're beginning to stratify patients based on specific genotypes, I don't think we can do like personalized models for everyone. That's just not scalable. But let's say we sort of find key features. We could maybe create genetically defined cell models 
that then might serve to you know, validate and, and, and explore, you know, what is the drug responsiveness? How does the beta cell respond if we can create those, you know, for, for certain buckets of patients? I think that could also be a way forward. Probably not, you know, I, I don't think it's realistic to think um, personalized, but. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're totally right, Mikey. I mean, if, if basically after some of this exploration, you, you kind of hone in on a particular node or pathway, then you can CRISPR that gene out or even introduce a variant, you know, the way it's been done for LDL cholesterol, when you can tweak PCSK9, you know, there's a paper in Nature just last week uh, or two weeks ago where in primates, you, you were able to simply change the one base pair in PCSK9 and bring the LDL cholesterol in these primates down to uh, very good levels and in a sustainable fashion by genome editing their liver. Anyway, you can do that in cells. So first you have to identify the pathway that matters, find that node that when tweaked, you might then you have then you have an in vitro system that then you can use for small molecule discovery and then throw in the kitchen sink as far as small molecules to see how you can recover that function that you change through through genetic mutations and then you're onto something. Correct. Norm. Thanks, Will. Uh, so I want to explore one of the areas that you discussed and is of keen interest to I think health research agencies in the modern era or is, is the balance of what the old uh, vision of, of excellent health outcomes for all individuals in our societies balanced with equity. And I think that we're facing a very new lens on equity, certainly in the jurisdictions that I work in. And great concern, even within a very advanced society like my own, um, that there is great disparity. And uh, so as we think about what we have talked about, which in some cases involves very complex discovery-based research, technology, clinical care, et cetera, is how are you thinking about moving towards the most excellent diagnosis and care and prevention and equity? How do we, let alone for low and uh, middle income countries, which are different than our own uh, classically, but even in our own context. Uh, can you talk about how you're thinking about that development? And perhaps we can have you all reflect on that. So, so I'll, I'll give you one example that is relevant to your context, Norm. Um, yeah. so you're probably familiar with the TBC 1D4 story. So it turns out that the Inuit, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable how, you know, all the Canadian presenters acknowledge uh, their ancestral lands. But the Inuit who live in Northern Canada, Alaska and Greenland, uh, they have been exposed to extreme climatological conditions for generations and generations. And you could imagine that that has led to some selection pressure. And so with that hypothesis, Danish scientists teamed up with local uh, people in Greenland and sequenced and then found a variant in TBC1D4 that changes to our glucose, not by a little bit, not by us ratios of 1.1, 1.2, but twofold. And then when you analyze the effect of that variant on type 2 diabetes, it's tenfold, huge effect, you know, approximating Mendelian or monogenic type mutations. And it turns out that because of the specific circumstance, whether it's because of selection or because of bottlenecks and population drift, that variant is quite common in people of Inuit descent. You know, it's in present about 17%. And we know the mechanism, it's in skeletal muscle and it helps transduce the insulin signaling for glucose uptake in skeletal muscle. That tells you that if you are a practitioner in Northern Canada or in Greenland or in Alaska and you take care of Inuit people, one in five of your patients with type two diabetes may have diabetes solely on the basis of that variant, uh, which means that maybe for them, an insulin sensitizer might be the intervention of choice. So the point I'm trying to make is that we need to, first of all, get away from deploying this discovery, genetic and other analyses in people of European descent where the resources are available. And it is an ethical imperative to expand that kind of exploration to all populations on earth, the major populations, uh, for two reasons. One is because you may identify variants like the one in the Inuit that actually have large effects where you can apply precision medicine and actually very quickly begin to implement a specific therapy but also because you're leaving uncovered a huge segment of genetic variation, uh, particularly when you ignore Africa where human beings arose and where half of the human variation exists that has not left Africa to other populations. So the very first order of business 
is to really make sure that these kinds of explorations, you know, the UK Biobank, 500,000 people, that needs to happen in every population in the world. Great, and I would just add that we're seeing phenotypes, for example, of uh, type two diabetes in youth, adolescents in indigenous populations uh, uh, in Canada that I think people had never seen before, uh, didn't, at least didn't recognize. So uh, at the origin of these is unclear, but uh, you know, to your point, uh, Please, other members of the panel. Um, maybe I'll just add to that. I absolutely agree with uh, what Jose just said. And I think, you know, we do have this challenge of getting access, you know, for example, to genetic testing to patients. And um, I can imagine one of the ways we're going to overcome that barrier is by showing cost effectiveness, showing, um, you know, benefit. So to like, you know, just to use exactly Jose's example, uh, we need, the studies that will show, you know, do either some kind of randomized control trial or do some kind of longitudinal follow-up where we can show that having that diagnosis, giving a particular treatment benefited, benefits patients so that whether in, in the case of Canada, maybe it means having government buy-in or, um, you know, in the U.S. it may be insurance payer buy-in, but we need to move to be able to, um, I think the way that we're going to have more equity is by not having it be on the individual to have to be able to, uh, uh, you know, put themselves forward to uh, be able to, uh, on their own, be able to access the type of care, but that it's more, you know, equitable, more accessible to everybody. So I, um, I think that there's been two really interesting themes of conversation uh, through today. One is um, the, the discovery and the application of the research, et cetera. Um, but, but I think also the, the delivery and, um, and the follow-up that we have and those personal connections that we have with our patients, right? So I get to spend 20 minutes every six months sometimes uh, with, with my patients with diabetes. Um, to, so to think that my, my 20 minutes is gonna impact um, the food choices that they make when they go home or their access to food, et cetera, um, I, I think is, is pretty short-sighted. So there's a whole microcosm of things affecting individuals. And um, although I think that a tool sort of example of, well, let's just move them from that zip code, um, you know, with all due respect, I, I think that's um, not, not actually going to fix the problem. So um, I, I think that there are, are definitely um, when we're talking about type one diabetes or type two diabetes, rather very, very substantial lifestyle uh, and food uh, and nutrition issues that we have to address. And I'm not sure that we're, we're doing a great job of that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Jose really foreshadowed what's gonna happen to other developing countries when they begin to adopt diets that are more similar to what we see in North America, right? Um, so I think that's one big issue. But then, you know, we're here because it's the 100th anniversary of insulin. Um, so I think that we can't celebrate that 100th anniversary of insulin without really acknowledging um, how much therapy cost for individuals. And I know that that's different between Canada and the United States, um, but, um, but the rise in the cost of insulin in our country has been um, astronomical. And, uh, and I think we have to address that. And technology is coming on board at an amazing pace and changing the lives of people with type one diabetes and in many cases, type two diabetes, but that's not accessible to everybody. So I think that when we talk about equity is sort of basic access to those sorts of things and nutritional diet, um, the very basics of diabetes therapy and treatment. And we certainly have a lot of work to do there. Great comments. Micah, anything you'd like to add? Not really. I think that everything has probably been said. I mean, like the treat, like prevention, I think, I think we're going to get to that. And next is, is of course, something where, you know, the future also lies. And that's where we have to really reach also out to people who we know are more at risk. And that is often driven by socioeconomic factors. Hmm. Will, over to you. Yes. Okay. So let's um, let's move ahead. And what I want to talk about now is um, along the same theme, but again, how do we make that difference? Okay. So we have bariatric surgery, we have lifestyle, we have technology, we have 15 to 16 classes of drugs, we have guidelines, and yet it doesn't appear to be making a dent. Okay. So my question to you is, um, uh, if we do, we have enough now to reclassify the types of diabetes? And if not, what will we need at this point? And if we get that, 
Do you really think it's going to, how we will use that to make a difference? So my question is, with all the tech, tech, the behavioral strategies we have, the management strategies, technology, uh, how do we use that? And secondly, is do we have enough to reclassify the patients now, or if not, what will we need? And my question is, where do we go in the future as far as a true reclassification, what's going to be needed? Uh, so let me st start there. So um, Miriam, you wanna start? Um, okay, well, I, when I think about this, I think there are some treatments that are going to be universal. And so in, there are some situations where maybe uh, the classification might not be as um, critical. And, uh, and then, but then there'll be other situations where potentially a classification, classification will be more critical. And I, and I think this just, for me, comes back to, again, just having the right data sets to be able to study this more appropriately that I just think we're, that we're really lacking right now the ability to have um, the test uh, to test any hypotheses in in multiple uh, data sets where we have longitudinal follow up that's well phenotyped. Uh, so, for example, you know, bariatric surgery, we would need uh, a large data set of people undergoing bariatric surgery that had the relevant biomarkers that we want to look at that we would be using in the uh, subclassification. Um, and and then to be able to compare that uh, to uh, simple clinical measures. Like if we really want to be able to answer this, I think we just, we still, unfortunately, I think, I believe uh, need more data that there's data that we just don't have to, to fully know. Thank you. Jose? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, we, Miriam and others have very illustrated a path forward for reclassification. So there's no question that we're going to be able to do that. Um, and I think as we mentioned, genomics is one starting point. It's not the only one. Uh, and to be refined, it probably requires additional biomarkers. But I think we will be able to go beyond diabetes, type 2 diabetes. You know, think about it. Type 2 diabetes is just a diagnosis of exclusion. So anybody who doesn't have autoimmune diabetes and who doesn't have monogenic diabetes or maybe pancreatic diabetes or some syndrome then gets thrown into this basket case of type 2, which is really very heterogeneous. So we will be able to subclassify. You can always cluster people and you can even define which of those people sit at some extreme. But what really needs to happen is to show that that kind of classification matters. And so the two, the two places where it might matter, it might matter in terms of the disease course and what kind of complications people get. So is there a differential rate of kidney disease or retinopathy or cardiovascular disease based on which cluster you belong to? Because that might change your surveillance. That may change what you do for cardiovascular prevention or even renal prevention. And then the other way it may matter is if there are specific interventions that are more effective in one, one group versus another. But that's the kind of data that needs to be generated. So Miriam and others have pointed the way as to one might begin to classify, and there's many people. And as I mentioned in my talk, the clustering is going to proliferate. But then the real hard part is to then show, okay, now that I be able to that I'm able to cluster people and do it in a robust and reproducible way, does it really make a difference clinically? And so you need to look longitudinally at complications databases or clinical trials or electronic medical records where that, those kinds of questions can be answered. And then once you establish that it makes a clinical difference, comes the health economic analysis of being able to say, okay, well then, if I am able to classify people and I know that it matters clinically, is it sustainable for the healthcare system because I am saving on dialysis or I'm saving on MI admissions, et cetera. Once you prove that then all of that matters, this is when you can actually begin to apply precision medicine. So the hard work, the, the initial work is gonna be the clustering. I would say within two to three years, we'll have a pretty good sense of robust clustering methods, but then showing that it clinically matters is the, the long haul. That will be a paradigm change from using glucose for the past 80 years of the century. <laughs> right. Mikey? You know, I'm by, I'll just finish by saying that it, it is possible through, through these approaches then you also might use it for discovery science in the sense of being able to identify a pathway that might lead to novel drug discovery. So if you're able to then, you know, uh, merge this uh, human-based clustering with the, the necessary model systems of the type Mikey was talking about, then you might be able to then on a dish be able to test that particular cluster for a specific novel uh, compounds that might serve as medications for that for that people. So that might lead to, to change in, in the armamentarium. Excellent. Mikey? No, that's that's the piece I wanted to add, so. Okay. Sorry. Uh, well, I was just gonna say one thing. Uh, I, I know that 
largely the comments were probably uh, focused around uh, type two diabetes, but I, I wanted to echo Jose's point about um, there's there's no need to 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 do that unless there's a, a way that you that it's actionable, right, to the at the clinician or the patient level, um, which I think is a parallel to where we are in type one diabetes with regard to prevention, right? So we've been talking a lot about screening with antibodies uh, in staging of type one diabetes, um, but but really now I think we're only at the point of saying okay, well giving people this diagnosis outside of a research setting of being autoantibody positive is not actionable um, and now has the possibility to be actionable, I think, with, um, with the recent trial results from uh, tepuzumab. So Norm, I think we have uh, time for one more set of questions, if you have any. Sure. Well, I think uh, maybe we can just push the envelope a little further and, uh, you know, this will be free thinking on your part. You really can say anything you want and nobody will blame you <laughs> for it. And, and I'm going to ask you to think about remission and cure, one versus the other. So uh, uh, be clear, if you will, when you're answering whether you think cure is attainable or whether we're really talking about remission and particularly in some types of diabetes. And what would be your, this is your moonshot to get it done. As we look, this is, this is the, uh, the agencies thinking forward and saying what's, you know, cause we've heard a lot of, uh, you know, incremental building the blocks, right? for approaching uh, diabetes in lots of different ways, all of which been nicely articulated. But, but if you can put it together, it's like, okay, here's, here's the moonshot for remission, cure, both. Uh, your thoughts. All right, maybe I'll take a, an initial stab. Um, you know, in terms of remission versus cure, you know, basically we think, we, I think we all agree that diabetes is caused mostly by environmental determinants on top of a genetic predisposition. And so the genetics we know accounts for maybe 30 to 40% of the risk and the rest of it is environmental. And the explosion of diabetes that has happened again in the last 50 years is driven by the environment. So given that, um, it's interesting that as a diabetes doctor, we are trying to not have patients come to our clinic. If we cure or uh, given that, I would say just to finish the cure and remission, given that we're talking about remission from the point of view that people will continue to have the genetic predisposition because that is in the germline and that is what they've inherited. So they have the genetic predisposition and it's just that if we change the environment, we bring them to the point that that has manifested itself in hyperglycemia. So I would say it really is remission. So given that the genetics is not really changeable in the individual. Hmm. So here we are now, I'm a doctor, uh, and what you're asking me to do is how do I stop seeing patients? How do I have them not have to come back to my clinic? How do I go out of business? That's what we're trying to do, drive ourselves out of business. And the only way that has happened in my experience is in bariatric surgery, or people who somehow got religion and it was early enough in the disease that they began to do exercise, et cetera, they were able to, to do something to, to make a difference. But really the people that I've been able to discharge from my clinic and never see again, are people who had bariatric surgery. And so the moonshot for me would be to really try to understand what insights come from that rewiring that takes place in the GI tract that shed lights on the environmental, dietary, and exercise determinants that leads somebody to develop insulin resistance, beta cell dysfunction, and hyperglycemia. Because there has to be some hormonal biochemical insights there that might either lead to a therapeutic intervention in the form of a molecule, or at least a dietary or lifestyle intervention that, that really does make a, a big difference. We're not gonna be able to change the environment in terms of the calories, you know, forcing people to change behavior is very difficult, but there's gotta be insights in bariatric surgery that can be harnessed molecularly. Okay, great. Who would like to comment further? I mean, I could maybe sort of yeah. go more on the type one, um, arm because I think Rosé um, really summed it up pretty well for type two. I mean, I think there is, you know, there's the, the one piece what we discussed is like, we, we're going to understand the processes. We hope that there's going to be new drugs. We're going to stratify patients and we're going to bring it all together. I think that's, um, that needs to happen. And that, you know, there's a good chance that will lead to insights that might ultimately be that moonshot. But then we have sort of these 
other innovative paths, and we haven't really talked about it um, in the context of type one much, but it came up yesterday, like the cell therapy piece, you know, can we actually, at least for a subset of people with type one, offer them a curative approach that um, goes beyond insulin, you know, and I, I think that that is, is there and there, you know, there's a lot of um, companies now in that space and clinical trials are um, on, on the way and there, you know, there's still a lot of things to be solved in terms of how do you package up the cells? Is it gonna be autologous, non-autologous? If it's autologous, what do you do with the autoimmunity? But um, those are sort of like maybe the moonshots that are already there at our fingertips where we can, you know, that we need to pursue and see um, whether that will have impact on the patient. And then there's the more longer term hope, hope for new immune shots that are going to come from the arduous discovery. Great. Carmela? Uh, so is it okay if I have a, a type one and a type two immune shot? You uh, can uh, okay. shoot away. Thanks. So, um, so I'll, I'll go with type one first. So it is, the panel has been, I think, 10% type one and and 90% type two as it should be, I guess. Um, but uh, for uh, to, to just continue on for type one, um, I think that you know, in, in Jose's sort of futuristic view of what what um, healthcare would look like when you have that genetic screening at birth, and I think that was in the context of um, what, what your polygenic risk might be for type two, et cetera. Um, well, we know an awful lot about the genetics of type one, so uh, I think it's it's pretty easy to also. Uh, determine if someone is at risk for autoimmunity, right? So I think my moonshot is that um, you combine genetics with autoantibody screening to understand when people are at risk of type 1 diabetes. And that, um, you know, in addition to the moonshot of cell therapy, we are now, I think, making inroads with immunomodulatory therapy and disease prevention. Um, but I think that we have a lot to um, try to get from the point of having one drug that worked in prevention to now trying to understand um, it, What's, what's happening to a person with a single autoantibody. Um, there are plenty of people who get type one diabetes that have a single autoantibody. How, how are they different and what would they need mm -hmm. to be treated with? And then, you know, these different metabolic sort of checkpoints and how do we use those to define the therapy that's right for that person at that time. Um, and I think that, um, so that would be the type one moonshot. The type two, um, I agree, you know, just amazing things happening with bariatric surgery. Um, but I think also the point was made about when people come to the endocrinologist, uh, and it's not the person who gets type 2 diabetes who's doing okay on metformin, um, they don't ever come to see me, right? Um, it's when they failed a bunch of stuff, and then they get, they get put in my clinic. So, um, so we miss likely this window of opportunity of reversibility, um, not because endocrinologists, um, you know, are, have some sort of magical elixir that they're going to give to um, the patient, but um, but that sort of really pounding hard about this is a point in time where things could be reversible with lifestyle changes, which we know from the diabetes prevention um, trial uh, and program worked. So I think that we missed that opportunity to really go hard after those um, those sorts of time points. Great. And Miriam. So um, I think I can when I think of uh, particularly with type two diabetes, um, I, I think of it in two aspects. One, as Jose mentioned, almost you know, wanting some way to miraculously undo the detriment of environment. Um, so if we can, that's why I really like Jose's suggestion about related to kind of what, it, what is it about bariatric surgery that kind of undoes a lot of what had been detrimental. The other side of that I think also would be what can we do to make the beta cell response more robust? So whether that means, you know, that not everybody who's obese or has, uh, you know, you know, challenging lifestyle um, situations has develops diabetes. So um, I think if we could maybe try to harness both aspects of that, and then the dream for me would be that we have some way, and this gets to uh, what Carmela had mentioned as well, uh, early on, recognizing which people are going to need that extra support and being able to give it to them in some form of uh, therapy uh, earlier on before they develop the disease. I can maybe just like one um, piece I think we haven't talked about. I mean, when you think about all these pathways that we discovered, the stress pathways, and that goes to your comment, Miriam, like, you know, make them beta cell hardier and, um, you know, more resilient. So how do you do that? And a lot of the pathways that we know do that operate across cells. So if we have a drug and we give it systemically, 
there's going to be side effects. And, you know, then it's this cost benefit ratio for the, for, for your overall health. And um, one thing we didn't talk about is the, the beta cell specific targeting. So, you know, if we could actually um, to make the hardier beta cell, I think we need beta cell specific delivery. And, you know, there's some interesting research going on in that space. There's been this work by um, AstraZeneca and Ionis um, with um, RNA targeting and using GLP-1 receptor ASOS delivery to um, target beta cells. They're still exploratory, but there's been a few publications on that. But I think that that would be an important piece of thinking about, you know, targeting these pathways that we discover in the beta cell. Great, uh, wonderful comments. You know, as Einstein said, if it's not crazy thinking at the beginning, it may not be worthwhile thinking about. So uh, I appreciate the fact that you're willing to get out there a bit and uh, go to the edge on the, on this one. And with that, uh, I think we're going to thank you uh, for your participation in this panel. Thanks so much uh, for be being willing to do so, your preparations and your comments during the panel. And with that, uh, uh, Will and I are going to uh, now uh, uh, give some thank yous and next steps. And uh, uh, I will begin. Um, I first want to uh, thank Will, uh, who's been a terrific collaborator. It's the first time in the history of CIHR that we've collaborated with uh, NIDDK for such a venture and it's been an absolute pleasure. And so Will, please give our thanks to all of your staff that have worked with us so well and to you in particular for, uh, you know, just having been so enthusiastic and, uh, and uh, such a great collaborator. So thank you very much. Um, Bye, sir. I want to thank the organizing committee. We named uh, all the members of the organizing committee at the beginning of this uh, uh, symposium, but again, thank you very much because from them came all the ideas of uh, what would be the areas that would be pursued, who would be the speakers that we could invite to get at uh, diversity across geography, across uh, sex and uh, other elements of our population, young investigators to hear what they're doing. Uh, they've been great. So thank you very much to all the members of that committee. Uh, thank you to the many speakers who um, offered great talks, uh, one after the other, uh, uh, some 25 people or so uh, during this uh, during this symposium. I think we heard a lot of enthusiasm for what you offered, extremely interesting science going all the way from cells to populations. And, uh, and finally, thank you to the moderators who uh, uh, thought were very thoughtful and careful about uh, uh, moderating your sessions, extremely helpful. Um, and allowed this symposium just to flow very nicely. So uh, thank you to all these individuals uh, and to all the people who were sort of quiet in the, uh, on the side and there, the, all the attendees. Uh, at times there were some 500 individuals who were attending uh, different parts of the symposium. We're very appreciative uh, for comments, uh, questions, and your participation. And with that, to you, Will. Thanks, Norm. Again, um, thank you and CIHR for the collaboration. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, I'd also like, like to thank the speakers, the moderators. And interesting, this has been such an, a hot topic. As Norm and I know, when we sent out the letters for invitation, it was incredible that within minutes we'd received the acceptance and we haven't seen that response in quite some time, and that just shows you how important this topic really is. I wanted to also let you know that um, this was recorded, and we are going to have the videos uh, placed on the website exactly where at this point we're working on it, but this will be recorded, and all the lectures will be available um, in a given time, probably uh, two to four weeks, but we'll make sure that these are, are posted, and we'll send all the participants information on where these videos will be held. Uh, finally, uh, we're also going to make sure that uh, the comments here and the findings are in the literature. And so we're actually working right now with uh, a couple of journals to publish the proceedings. And we're hopeful that uh, with by the fall, we'll have this in print, hopefully online sooner. But uh, our hope is to have the proceedings published 
and at least two journals, three journals across both the U.S. and the United States. And we have firm commitments from journals that they're very interested in seeing the proceedings. So with that, I'll close. It's been a uh, wonderful two days. And again, I want to thank everyone for their participation, for their effort, and uh, a great way to usher in the next century of diabetes innovation. So thank you again, Norm. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope everyone has a good afternoon, regardless of your area of the world. Take care.